it's looking pretty good, just mainly on these shoulders. You can see where I've taken the, uh, the bright neutral gray and the dark warm gray and created a mix. Tommy Lee, what is going on? Hey, 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 what is happening? So you can see how I, I've got this kind of muddy gray. I say muddy gray, it's got a little bit of a brownishness to it, right? And we're just literally just kind of slopping it on there, blending pretty harsh onto these surfaces. Create some textures for the metal and give us back some of that mid-tone. So again, this is just bright neutral gray and uh, dark warm gray. And as soon as you start desaturating uh, bright warm gray, or um, I'm sorry, dark warm gray, you'll start getting this kind of really deep muddy gray out of it. Hence the bright in the name, right? Or the uh, warm in the name. Boy, I'm just all over the place today. And what that's going to do is give us a little bit of a tonal shift when we start doing our top layer. And allow us to get some of these mid-tones to shift a little bit without having to use a whole lot of different colors. Right, because today what we're planning on doing, the main focus of today is going to be to get the, uh, the blacks onto the model. And that's going to be a lot of transparent black with transparent red, transparent blue, right? And so now you can imagine how red and blue are going to sit a little bit differently, look a hair different if they hit these kind of grayish browns in the mid-tones. Now, we, because somebody had asked the other day, we've kind of gone off the rails with how we're doing this black. I, I don't know that I would have normally gone this, this far out into left field, and this is a very complicated black. You don't have to do all this had you not done. If you go back and watch um, Tuesday's video, if you weren't here for that, or if you forget what we did, right? Go back and, and stare at Tuesday's video a little bit, and you'll see that there was a point before we started adding black into the shadows on this model when it was perfect to start doing your, your layer painting over the top. Uh, somebody had asked about doing uh, kind of the... I don't remember what the exact question was, but it entailed being able to paint the shadows back in. And I had said, or if you weren't going to have an airbrush and overpaint and layer and underpaint and all that. And I said, yeah, you can actually work your black into your shadows and use the whites and the grays that we did in the upper reaches of the model as, uh, as the foundation rather than coming back and doing what we're going to do, which is uh, paint the black transparent all over it. Uh, in order to do that, you probably don't want to go quite as bright uh, with your highlights as we did because our highlights are built on here in pure white so that we can go and dump the black transparent back over them and dumb them way down, right? So the only thing I need to do is with the airbrush, get a little bit of bright neutral gray in there and hit, or I can probably do a little bit of white. Let's do it with white, just very thin down white. Uh, two shoulders, head, I think the backpack's pretty good, maybe a little bit on the globes, just to fuzz out the real rough nature of these uh, grays that I put back on there. Cause I haven't really been thinking about blending, right? I've just been sketching them in. And I'll show you how real quick with the airbrush, you can smooth all that right back out and get us where we need to be. Hock a duck. And we still don't have better Twitch TV either, do we? I think the audio on your computer is jacked, Jen, because this is, I'm in the red. I can't turn it up anymore on our end. Citadel, what's going on? Ski, I keep calling you Citadel. Why did you change your name? <laughs> Why aren't you just schematic anymore? Life was easier before people started changing their names. I'm one to talk. We've changed our name like 80 million times. Steiner Miniatures, what's going on? Never cease to amaze you with new techniques to try. So when you underpaint, you know, we do this a lot around here. And, and we always talk about how you can underpaint anything, right? It's, it's a matter of, of mental gymnastics 
to understand what it is you're trying to create on the model and how the different stages of your painting help get you to that creation. So if you underpaint, which we use a lot for, you know, everything from pre-highlighting just to get your values sketched on here like this guy, but uh, you notice that when painting black armor and such, it's 99.9% .9 value sketching, right? Because black is really just black and white. We're going to add other colors, but for the most part, you're dealing with value sketch to get to your end product. Underpainting allows you to be a little bit rougher. You can put paint over the top of it. It'll help blend a lot of this for us, right? But for what we're doing here, we're just kind of tweaking it because we know that we're going to be adding black transparent. And I've already told you we're going to be doing black and red transparent mixed together in the shadows and black and blue transparent mixed as the top coat. So um, when we know that, we can say, well, what would make those blues and those reds kick a little bit more and not be just, you know, pinks where they hit the gray, although we'll hopefully be doing the reds just in the shadows, or, you know, bright pale blue where they hit, you know, the kind of mid-tones. So we want to get this kind of gray in here that'll shift those colors a little bit, help the black be the main portion, um, and still give us some color differences, right? Because now we do have, like, you know, pure black in the deepest shadows, or almost pure black in some of the deepest shadows. Then we come out into, like, a deep gray uh, because of the pre-highlight with the white. And now we've added in this kind of brownish gray, and that's going to help move those colors around and give us a weird uh, kind of multi-tonal shift if we're lucky. Right. And so I've really just kind of sketched it into areas where I've got a little bit of the dark gray, a little bit of this brown gray and then my edging. Right. So I still maintain all of my value sketch and my volumes. Uh, the only thing I want to do, I might want to add a little bit more darkness on this. So I got a little carried away there. So I will grab a little bit of coal black. It is Whip Thursday, Therapy Thursday. You know the drill. If you got stuff you want to show off, we will be taking uh, at least one look over at Whip during the course of the day today as normal. Sometimes we do it in the middle. Sometimes we do it at the very end. Um, but feel free to go post some stuff up. So this is just real thin coal black, right? And what I want to do here, get most of it off of my brush and just then move from my highlights back into my darkness. About like that. Maybe smudge a little bit with my finger along that border. And just bring some good darkness back in there. I can even kind of just go with vertical strokes if I don't want that texture line right across there. And then smudge that. And get that blend real quick. We're going to be overpainting it so we don't need it to be perfect. But that does a really good job. Uh, all right. I'm pretty good down here, I think. Might broaden that out a little bit at the base. Give me a little bit of darkness back in right here. And just kind of tailoring all of these areas. Again, I'm going a little bit further than you would really need to. Um, there's no necessity for doing this three and four times like you see me doing. But again, painting super thin. See how that black has barely got any opacity to it? And then I can just kind of gradually bring it into the bottom corner of this pad. And use my quick finger smudging there. A nice blend. Bring that darkness back on the back of the pad here. I'm not really worried about blending back here. Just leave that rough. Maybe carry that a little bit on over here. I want to go ahead and darken my edges. I can put some there too. So we've got there, we've got there. Everywhere else looks pretty good. Maybe build a little bit more darkness right in that edge. Just glazing black into our recesses again. Real, real thin. Real quick, because again, the, these real thin blends and glazes will get covered up completely for any, you know, brush stroke that you've got in them, as long as you do your top coat right. Now, that could be something that's scary for people because they're like, I don't know what that means when I'm doing my layering right over the top of underpainting. And so we're going to talk to you all of those steps as we go as well. 
pretty happy with all of this. They want to get in here and darken all of this up on the underside here. But again, pulling away from this spot where we've got a little bit of brightness on the backpack over, you know, towards the right, our right. I guess technically this is his right as well. So that I build most of my darkness up along this bottom edge here because my brush strokes leaving it all over there. Okay. That's starting to look pretty good. I'm really liking the shine and everything on him, so I think we're pretty set. We'll airbrush those shoulders to get that brightness back on him real quick, and then we'll go into doing just black. Well, huzzah, huzzah. I just throw back my legs and pollute my britches with delight. Who dat? Telemachus, what is going on, man? 37 freaking months. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Always with the horrible jokes. Always worth the price of entry, though. Don't go changing, friendo. Get a little shadow on this side of the collar right out of his beaky nose there. Just a little bit of black right there on the top of the collar. Get a little bit over here from where his head maybe shades this side away from our light. I don't know that I'm really worried about that. little bit more opaque so I can find a nice contrast to create some shine on the curve of this backpack lid right there. Oh, sorry, just a little off stream. So I would really, really urge you, if you've never tried any of the underpainting techniques that we've shown you on the channel, give them a go. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised with some of the really cool things you can do and how some of the things that you create with underpainting will really up your painting game considerably. I'm gonna go in and just do a little bit of darkness right there. And right there. Okay, well, hopefully you can see the setup we're going for. Go ahead and broaden out the darkness at the base of that shoulder there just a little bit. Yeah, Armin's, we get sick of telling it every single time. We're waiting on uh, all, we still need the bottling machine too. So we've got some hardware that we're waiting on, raw materials that we're waiting on, but have no fear, we're on it. 
as soon as that stuff uh, as soon as that stuff hits we're going for it what is going on Armas by the way Zambies what's happening girl you put some water in the bottle shake it up very thin glazable coal black that's mean I mean geez I don't get it I feel like camera you and me need to have a talk I want to be right about here how about you sound good Sounds good. All right, so airbrush. Oh, I'll be right back. Somebody needs to change the title of the stream to the wheels are off. Turns out, rumor has it, that if you uh, don't want to blow through a straw real hard, you need your air compressor turned on in order to airbrush. I know. I know. I'm the purveyor of amazing news. Things you didn't know for 1500 I'll take uncommon knowledge for 800 Bob. I was going to say, I don't think, I didn't think black was out, but maybe. Coal black might be out of stock. Bum cover for a thousand bill. I'd like to buy a vowel. <laughs> All right, we're going to take a little bit of white, just titanium white. I've been trying to be really good about this because, you know, uh, put the uh, flow improver in the, in the pot first before we add the white. So a big hefty squirt of flow improver. This just helps you a lot. I've had a lot of people say, hey, you know, when I mix in the pot like I see you doing, I don't get any good results. The paint's all over the place. I don't get the consistency I want. And so then I just put two drops of white in that flow improver. I want it super thin. Uh, if you put the flow improver in the pot first and then you put the paint, then you're guaranteeing yourself that all you get is mixed uh, flow improved paint at the nozzle, right? Because you've got flow improver all the way down sitting at the nozzle before the paint. So it's just a matter of physics at that point. It may not be mixed at the nozzle because you can't get anything down in there to mix it. Um, but you're guaranteeing yourself that flow improver sits at the nozzle. Where if you put the paint in first, the paint flows to the nozzle and clogs all that up. Not clog in a bad way, it just takes all that space up. And then you put flow improver and it sits behind it. Then you mix it together and you still have unmixed pure paint out by the tip of the nozzle. And so as, uh, Kind of a no-no. All right, so now we're just going to get in real close, real quick with the airbrush. Right, I'm going to focus in on the top of this shoulder pad where I've got these messy blends now. Right, I'm about an inch, inch and a half away. And I'm just going to pull the trigger a little bit harder, start pulling back. As I start seeing color, just keep aiming at the same spot. Pull back. All right, there we go. That quick, we get back to really nice blend off the top of that shoulder pad, but I've got all those mid-tone grays that have that kind of brownish to them now, right? But I get that real nice shine that I wanted. And this is really thin, so as this cures, you're going to see it get darker, right? Same with the top of the head. I'm going to get in about half an inch away. Wait till I start seeing paint right there where my white is, my bright elliptical shape of white, right? Get in real close as I start seeing that white build up like that, kind of wiggle it around, then pull the brush back, and then... As I'm pulling back, I'm pulling the trigger harder and harder. So I get more paint coming out of the brush because if, you, if you're in close, you don't want to pull the brush real tight, right? Because you pull the trigger real tight, you get that. It just flowers out, right? So when you're in real close, you're doing this, right? You're barely getting any paint at all. But as you pull back, if you don't pull the trigger harder, see how that doesn't change? Because I've got so little paint that I have to get in close again over here for there to be paint showing up. See that? So if I get in, I've never changed my, my trigger pressure as of yet. And so I got to get in real close for that paint to start building up like that, right? But if I pull back, holding it in the same area, nothing changes. 
because I've got so little bit of paint coming out that by the time I'm six inches away from the model, none of that paint is able to hit the model and make a difference. It spreads out in the cone of air and you just don't even see it, right? So instead, I've got to get in close, pull the trigger very lightly to get my dot built up and then start pulling the trigger more and more and more the further I pull away. And that's how you get that blend, right? That's how it feathers all of that out, all right? Corn on macabre. Maybe the best name I've heard in a long time. No offense to anybody else with great names, but Corn on Macabre may be one of the best Twitch names ever? Question mark? I don't want to give them too big of a head so your hats don't fit, but that's a damn good name right there. Welcome. Thank you for the follow. So is, is that clear with regards to how we do our airbrushing? Because I, I say this a lot. Get in tight, wait for there to be color, and then I'll talk about moving the brush around, holding the trigger. This is the same amount of paint that I'm doing, but now I'm moving the brush around, and I'm getting that blend, and I'm forcing it where I want it to go, kind of like that. Or get in tight. You want to have a, a, you know, like we're doing here. We want to have that conical or elliptical highlight, right, that follows the top of a dome on a, on a circular piece. And so in order to do that, you're not going to want to jiggle the, the airbrush around a lot because you don't get a circle. You get, you know, a weird, you know, shape. So you want to do exactly what I did here. You want to get in close, wait for there to be some paint that shows up, start pulling. If I just sit here and I pull the trigger harder, right, it does that. Okay, spider's out because I'm too close, too much volume of paint hitting the model at this distance. The air does all the work and pushes the paint around. So what you want to do is vary that. Get in close till you start seeing the paint, start pulling back and start pulling the trigger heavier and heavier until I'm almost full trigger pressure by the time I'm eight inches away from the model. But now I have that circular blend. Right? It's not a fine dot, right? It's a circular blend that gives me the perfect ability to do the top of heads and shoulders and things like that. So that's exactly what I'm doing right here. Get in close, get a little bit of paint starting to show up, and then as I pull out, start pulling the trigger harder and harder. And that's going to blend that for me. Same on this shoulder, right? You can see how it's all rough, right? Because we've just been jabbing the brush at it. So here we go in and blend that in there. Just start wait until you start seeing a little bit of white like that, then start pulling the trigger harder and harder, pulling the brush back. Aiming at the same point the entire time. And now instead of that real harsh spot, it starts to blend those edges out. We'll do that on the globe of the uh, exhaust here real quick. Not going anywhere near as hard with this stuff because these little bitty things are already pretty good. Fudge these a little. I'm working with such a thin white paint and I'm gonna come back and amp these up just a little bit. The goal here is just to blend to make up for the heavy sketching that we've done. Right? We're not really trying to add a lot of brightness. We're using this as a smudge stick, if that makes any sense, right? Okay. So that just helps us blend stuff back together. If you have any other areas, like if you look across the model and you've got, like if, it, if I hadn't come back in and like, you know, wet blended these things and made them look better, then I could do that. Up here at the top of this uh, area here, I might come in and just very quickly start using the brush, wiggling it back and forth to blend right up at the top of the knee there, give it a little bit of shine. And you'll notice, like I've been saying, right, this white is so thin that it's gonna, when it cures, it gets rid of a lot of that feel. Right? I can come down here and do the same thing on the boot. Just bang that up just ever so slightly right on the edge of the, the foot there. What it does is it just kind of pumps up our mid-tones and our highlights. So if I want to do that on the inside of this knee, it got really dark when we put the black in there. So I come in and just aim right at that knee pad, right? Let it wait until it starts getting that light gray because our white is so thin. But now that light gray hits the top of the knee and do the same thing. Pull back. Get a little bit of white going at the top of the greave there at the chin area, a little bit on the knee, and bingo. Our paint is so thin that our white becomes light gray. Does exactly what we need it to do. Want to get the instep of the foot a little bit down here. You can imagine there being just a little bit of glow coming back off the ground maybe. 
So we give it a little bit of mid-tone down there. So it's almost like white becomes 80 different colors for you when you do this. You just got to get good at controlling the airbrush uh, positioning, distance to the model, um, and motion, right? How much painting you're pulling out and how you're moving it around. I'm going to get just the inside of the shin there. Buzz that out just a little bit. And just real quick, hit all these areas that I want like this. Give them a little bit of glow to grab our mid-tones back. The belly plate looks really good, so I'm not going to do much there. A little bit on the pec muscle coming out of that bright white. And already good on the shoulder. Get a little bit where we've got this hard edge on the beak. And a little bit on his forehead here. Brighten that forehead up just a tad. Load up a little bit more paint on the head. So I'm happy with that. That's pretty good. Okay. Too much of this and then you go back in the other direction where when we put the black transparent over the top will be so bright that all we'll get is uh, the color that we're gonna mix into the blacks. I'm gonna hit a little bit on the side of the knee here. Kind of up on the top of the greave like we did on the other side and just kind of feather it down and out over the knee real quick. Build up a little bit of blend right in the catch of the knee. All right. About three inches away and fuzz this line right here where we have white and then gray. Just fuzz that real quick. Same over here. Just moving vertically along that line. Doesn't matter which angle I come at it from. Just want to get a little bit of fuzziness along that white that we built up. Anything right here. And I think that's enough. I don't think we need much more. We can go. Wash that up. Move to black. Mediocre, what's going on, man? Thurgood, how do I like the Grex TG3? Only brush I use, man. We use a uh, Badger uh, Patriot for doing priming, but I only use the Grex. Um, we are in talks with them, as a matter of fact, to give you an idea of how much I like these brushes. Uh, we're in talks with them to be able to do a special virgin, version, virgin? A special version of the TG3 and the, I can't even remember what the top trigger one is called, what they call it, um, for Monument Hobbies. So if we ever come out with an airbrush, the plan is that it will be a Grex. I love Grex brushes. Uh, best quality of build, comparable to any of the top end brushes that you'll find out there. The way they do their needles just matches with my uh, mechanical sensibilities. Most companies do uh, what is called a, a compound taper term that I was uh, sh that was shared with me. I used to just call it a short taper, but a, a compound taper as opposed to a straight taper, uh, meaning that the angle along the, the length of the needle changes more than once to get to the point, whereas the Grex needles uh, only have a straight taper, meaning that it, it do you don't notice a hump on the needle. It just goes from the full circumference of the body to the, the needle tip in a very linear fashion, which means that you get a lot more control out of a 0.3 needle. All I ever use is a 0.3 needle. And uh, I never have to change to a 0.2 or a 0.5 with this brush because that straight taper gives me complete range of control from the finest to just full bore, all paint. But the TG with the trigger pull uh, is just the way I prefer to paint. Uh, we use top trigger brushes as well. It doesn't really matter. I can do whatever with whatever. Um, it's a much more natural uh, uh, movement to be able to, you know, pull uh, a trigger, right? So, you know, pulling a, a trigger like on a gun is a much more natural motion. You use it with, I don't know, cleaning bottles and, you know, you name it. Every day you've done this motion in your entire life probably. 
whereas the top trigger is a little bit more of a learned response um, where you have to teach yourself how to do that. So especially for people that are just starting out, I'm a big fan of, uh, of using the uh, top trigger to get that, or the, uh, the pistol grip to get that comfort, right? Doka, what's happening? Does a special version get thrown into the volcano? The special virgin? <laughs> the special virgin airbrush get thrown into the volcano? Is that how that works? I feel like there is like a ceremony or something. I was using a number two igniter earlier. That's what that was, man. It's a number two igniter. It's what I've been using on this whole thing. Generally, I don't paint with igniters, right? I've been I've been showing people the sables. We go in we go in batches, right? I, I will like you know for all these space marines, I've been using a number two igniter to do all of it. And uh, you know the next thing we do, I'll probably be jumping back into using deck cords or artillery brushes or something. I typically go in uh, rolling stages so that you know you might come in and see me just using artillery brushes for a week you know so that I can get people to feel that everything I do I can do with any of the brushes that we we have um, but we can then focus in because a lot of people of course ask what's the difference between the brushes what makes you know uh, one better for a person than another and so I'm always painting with all of them lately I've been on a big big synthetic kick I haven't used a lot of sables over the past few months ghostly gamer what's going on Testing some freehand stuff for your salamanders. Nice. Just testified. <laughs> yes, Jen is doing a much better job of... Uh, I got so frazzled at the beginning of the stream of the audio problems. Um, we have a new command. Exclamation point. Testify. Get on your soapbox and testify. We are looking for your uh, best and most memorable moments, the things that you have enjoyed the most with Monument Products or the stream itself, uh, and give us some testimonials so that we can use those as we go forth and spread the word of Monument to the world. You got a dragon insignia about the size uh, for your dread needs smaller for Marines. Freehand's a lot of fun, man. We've been uh, on all these Marines. We talk about it quite a bit because, like, we've just gone in and, and the other day we had to do the the numerics on the the shoulder plate for the the three. And of course, we're I I don't use decals, so I freehand everything. So uh, all of the shoulder plate insignia and all that for our Dark Angel, we went in and did that freehand the other day. Um, it's all literally, as you probably know, if you're if you're trying to do uh, the dragon head or the salamander head on your salamanders, it's literally just lay out the basic shapes. I, I tell people more often than not, don't try to draw the salamander head as a thing. Draw it as a collection of things. It's probably a circle towards the back, a couple of triangles for the mouth, a bunch of triangles for the teeth, and just paint each of those individual shapes as you go. Makes it a lot easier than trying to just make the thing. Like if I were going to sit down and draw, I'd just draw the salamander head, right? But with a paintbrush, it's a lot more difficult to do that. You can definitely do it the more practice you have. But at the beginning, I'm usually trying to tell people, bust it down into its component parts and do it from there. All right, so you can see after our white has cured that uh, it's retreated back up, but it's still blurred out all of that rough uh, blending that we did up at the top. So we still get that mid-tone gray, that kind of dust gray that we created, right? But when you paint thin, you got to remember to be patient so that you can, you know, in this case, put it on with the airbrush, let it all start to cure before you make your determination. Because at first, when you put it on, it's going to look more bright than it will be when it cures uh, because it's super thin. Once all of the water evaporates out of it, it lays on the model. The thinner you paint, the less of that actual vibrancy shows after it cures. Uh, so that's what we were doing here, right? So after it dries, we can still see all of those other colors layering in there, right? But what it did is it got rid of that rough patch of uh, non-blended color at the top of the shoulder plate and gives us back uh, what we need on the whole picture there. All right. So now we're going to mix up some transparent black with some transparent red. All right. Black and red transparent into the pot, and we are going to spray that into our shadows. <gasps> That might be better advice, says Ghostly Gay. <laughs> it makes complicated shapes become very easy. We, I usually use the Imperial Fist as a way to do it. Let's take a break. Thursdays are really great. We use that for training and, and teaching and, 
and cool techniques and stuff. So feel free to ask any questions. We are not on a clock to get anything finished on our Marine here. Um, I use these things we call magic cards. There's a good example of doing a sword as a free hand, somebody had asked, right? Is rather than trying to just paint a sword, I painted a circle, an upside down triangle, a rectangle, a rectangle, and a triangle. And then you get a sword. And you can connect them however you want, put little details on them as you want. You know, the circle can be broken down into four quarters. You can do this one, then you do this one, then you do this one, then you do this one. Uh, thing you have to realize when painting with a brush is that you're doing calligraphy. You're not, it's not a pencil. And so if you were going to try to do this entire curve with a brush, it's going to start out okay and it's going to be great until you get right here, right? And the line is going to thin out. And then as you get down here, it's going to thicken up again. So you're going to wind up with, with the line up here good. And then as you bring it back down, just because of the motion of the hand, you've got calligraphy. You've got a thin line that turns into a thick line. So you want to try to keep it held more like a pencil and you want to do this quarter, right? Stop, maybe rotate it, you know, if you have to, and then do this quarter, right? So you're never pulling the brush past 90 degrees, right? So you start here, you want to go a max of 90 degrees. As soon as you start coming back in, right, to 91 degrees, then you start getting a thicker line, hence calligraphy. That's how calli uh, calligraphers, right, uh, get the all that to work. So over here, I'd pull down like this, and then I might turn it over like this because I like to pull paint and do this side like that. So really just break all of your, your individual components into their, their various parts and pieces, and it makes it a lot easier. I had an Imperial Fist one that I like to, to use because it's a, it's a really good way to look at all of the shapes. Looks like we've done an Aquila at some point in time. Good God. We should go back. Like, I know everybody jokes and says I need to be doing this, but I should go back and take all these cards and create a book. <laughs> page by page for all the things we've done over the years because God knows I've got a stack of these a mile tall. Anyway, you get the idea. I don't know where that one is. You know, there's only 50 million of these things. Ah, there it is. Oh. Right? So doing like the Imperial Fist logo, same thing. We've broken it out into its individual parts. It's four rectangles, a fifth rectangle, a triangle for the base of the thumb, kind of a weird, you know, oblong rectangle-ish with an angle on it, uh, and then a rectangle, and then a bunch of triangles. One, two, three triangles that you then just draw lines and connect if you want to get the, you know, the shape of it like that. And you just refine it as you go. You can, if you do this, then you can go back in and thicken those shapes up, as opposed to trying to do the fist all at once. And maybe you carry a line too far, and now you're unbalanced. If you do these individual shapes, you always have the ability to stop, readdress, shift things over, make one fatter or thinner, whatever you have to do. But at the end, they come into uh, being, and they visually look like exactly what you wanted. Especially in miniature, you know, a lot of people just draw that way, right? Like in, if you were ever in an art class, then when you had to draw your first animal, it probably told you to draw it using a bunch of circles and cones and cylinders and stuff like that. Wolf Lord Kell says, that is not a space wolf. I could lie to you and say this is going to be a space wolf, but then you'd have to turn the stream off real quick because otherwise here pretty fast you're going to realize I was lying to you. All right, so let's do this. Let's figure out, and this is where I have no idea. So I'm going to put like one or two drops. First, flow improver. Remember, fuse. Flow improver. All right. Flow improver in there in the cup. Then I'm going to take one, two drops of red. It's probably too much. I probably should have stayed with one because I don't need a whole lot of paint, but we're going to go for it anyway. Then with the uh, transparent black, we're going to do uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Six to two, whatever that is. Whatever percentage that equals. All right, then we'll mix that up. The flow improver is obviously to get everything to be thin so we can layer and to move quickly, even though the transparents are super low viscosity, so they're not going to cause you a lot of problems on the uh, tip dry side of things, even if you run them straight out of the bottle. All right, so we've got that mixed up. We're going to take a little bit out and look at what we've got here, right, because it's going to be kind of a brownish coloring there. 
It's going to have a little bit of purple going to it and such. So let's see. It's probably still a little too red. The red is really, really punchy for our uh, transparent. So I'm going to empty some of that out. Like so. Throw in a lot more black. Uh, you know, it's interesting. You can do what I'm doing right now by taking, say, blue and red, you know, like a really good blue, blue, and a really good red, red. So like uh, blue or dark blue and uh, bold pyro red. You can mix those together and you'll get a really good uh, warm black, believe it or not, to uh, go in and use your color theory if that's something you're into. I prefer cheating and just use black and red because why not? And I'm gonna get this wine berry kind of color going on here. Right. There we go. See that? Nixton, what is going on? All right, so we've got a nice dark, dark black red here, and we're going to start using that just in the shadows, right? So I'm going to be holding the model mostly firing up from our worm's eye view and kind of specifics, just going in here and hitting in our shadow areas. I want to be careful not to pull this out into the um, bright grays and whites too much if I can avoid it. It's not bad if I get a little bit going on in there. It's not the end of the world. All right, but underneath the leg there, on the shin, top of the foot where I got that dark line. All right, we're gonna go inside of the thigh. You could be doing all this with a brush, right? For expedience sake, we're just doing it with airbrush. But you could go in and brush all this on just as easily if not more easily, right? Because the airbrush is a pain for a lot of people to get in and do this fine detail work with. I say detail work, we're not like drawing fine lines, but it's still a specific placement of paint counts as detail work as well. All right, so I wanna get in between the two white lines on his belly plate there. So get in real close. All of this stuff up underneath the chest plate area. Underside of this arm over here. Feel like my needle's a little gummed up. It is. There we go. Side of the grave over here, underneath this knee. Right down along the bottom of the shoulder plate and just a little bit up into the gray because I do want a little bit of this red to read out there, although it may get covered up by the blue. We might come back and want to add it in a little later or whatever. Hopefully you can see just a little bit of the red, but you can see how the black is really darkening everything up. Okay. My tip is clogging pretty quickly here. Oh, because you know what? I dumped out all of my flow improver, didn't I? I forgot. Shame on me. At the beginning when we mixed this, we then went back and dumped out all the flow improver. Rip. All right, so just 
continue to do this red coming out of our darkness into our mid-tones, a little bit across the forehead, side of the ear. I'm about a half inch to an inch away, depending on what I'm painting, where I'm trying to get color. I don't want to get the top of the ear, but I want to get the side of the ear right there and the side of this back of his helmet real quick. Inside of this arm in here, got to remember I took the protective cover off of the nozzle. Alrighty. That all looks pretty good. All this area that's like pure black up in here, it's fine. Get this shoulder. This one has a lot more shadow towards the back, so we'll do a lot more red. Stretching that up across this blend that we've done here. And then just a, maybe a little, I don't think we want a whole lot up front, so we'll just leave it like that. Underside of this arm. Transparence doing what transparents do, allowing all of that mid-tone gray and all that edge highlight to still show no matter how much we bang on there. And we're starting to add in some neat coloring. Uh, you could obviously add more color, change the color. You don't have to use red. Uh, you could add anything you wanted to do to this. It, the idea is just to give it some depth. Purple works really, really good here. You guys know I love purple. Uh, so purple transparent in with this. Uh, mix some red and some purple transparent and go have a field day. It's up to you, right? You could do blue here. Uh, you could mix non-transparent colors in here and do some stuff. Whatever you like. The world is your oyster at that point, right? Get some red up underneath the collar. A little bit right there, a little bit underneath in the inside of the collar as well. Side of the backpack, underneath here. Everywhere I've got that trend to really dark black, underneath the disc on the center of the backpack here. Again, just kind of wait for my color to build up, kind of push up a little bit so it gets a little bit of that red coming out of the shadows. Underside of this arm coming around into these mid-tones here. Right, get in real tight along the grieve shadow line right there. I feel like I'm really, really fighting this because I dumped out all of my flow improver. Side of the grieve. If you're doing like, say, Death Company, right? Another uh, Space Marine that will have a lot of uh, black on it, but is for Blood Angels. So red being the other primary component of that army, you could do your Death Company. You could let a lot more of the red show on this, right? So we've just got this deep, like red, almost like wine stain color going on. Uh, but you could uh, you could go and pump the red up and still have it remain black. You might want to at that point do a little bit more black shading on the actual uh, model as an undercoat when we did our pre-highlight. That's all up to you. Play with it. Let it be what it wants to be, right? I don't have to have red everywhere and then blue everywhere red doesn't go. That's not the case. There can still be some areas that don't get either red or blue, right? Like the side of this head, the side of this head, as if he has two. The left side of his head, his helmet, I'm not going to worry about it all. Uh, I'm going to get a little bit of the red right down on the backpack. Right there. 
and right here where my darker shadows exist. Maybe maybe a little bit right across, although I don't know that I want to do that. Eh, yeah, we will. We'll push a little bit right across there. All right. Get a little bit more on the underside of these globes for the exhaust ports here. Like so. get a little bit right in here where this range finder thing above his ear causes a little shadow. We'll get a little bit of black red in there as well. Okay. back and reevaluate everything, make sure we like the way the red is coming through and where it's coming through. It's not going to have much effect on areas that didn't have any color, like that were just pure black. This is going to take a lot of this to pump those into any shape of red, and that's fine. Um, we're not looking for the deepest shadows, like on the inside of his thigh, to really read as red at all. And, and we weren't really trying. I hope it's, it's evident to you that things like this are not meant to paint red armor, right? They're meant to give the feel of depth to your black. When you're using a color like black, gray, white, any kind of monochromatic palette stuff that you may be doing, lots of browns, really doesn't matter. If they aren't vibrant colors to begin with, giving them a little bit of extra oomph, you know, and shift a color can help. Like looking at it right here, I don't know that you guys can see much red, right? Right across here on the backpack is the place where I see the most of that kind of wine color showing through. But notice how it subtly exists down on the shadows of the leg now, right? Back of the shoulder plate, right? I get that depth to it. That color adds a lot of, of cool factor to a model that otherwise would have been very bland. Even if you knocked your black out of the park and got all the shine perfect and all of that, it's still gonna be bland um, if you're not adding something to the shadows and the highlights. You'll see a lot of people when they do black, they'll go in and, uh, and do blue highlights to it, bluish highlights to it, and that's why we do that. But the blue highlights alone can make it look real funky if you don't have a reason or you know something to go along with them that makes it feel at home. And so having all the shadows of the model move into a little bit of a different color helps an absolute ton, right? So that's pretty good. We'll evaluate it, make sure we got it where we want it. We didn't miss any place. Since it's black, we could use just about any color. Yep, any color. That's what I was saying. Greens work great. Um, you can basically figure out how you want to tell the story. I'm just choosing red and blue because warm and cool. Um, if you can have a little bit of warmth on a model, a little bit of cool on a model, then you, you help balance just the visual nature of it. And I, I don't know what it is. It's just kind of a psychological view for me. I want to see a little bit of warmth, a little bit of cool. They don't have to be 50-50. So that's why I'm saying, like, we're not looking to balance the red-black on here with the blue-black. Obviously, the blue-black is going to have a lot more intensity with the blue because it's going to get shot right over our brightest areas. So you'll see when I spray it, these bright areas become blue, like deep gray blue, right? And so the red just lives in the shadows to offset that a little bit. And in a lot of cases where they meet, the blue will overtake the red. And so we're going to have to be careful with that so we don't have the blue on the shoulder plate just erase that red altogether. So again, we'll be running really, really thin and building up as we go. We'll use a lot less blue in the black because we will be going thin and we will be layering a lot, whereas the red, we could pretty much just hit it and be done because we're firing into areas that were already black, number one. So they don't need a whole lot of reinforcing for shadow. Um, and all we wanted to do was give a little bit of hint of that kind of reddish wine color. But yeah, if you wanted to have him standing in a field of grass, you could have green in there and have that tell a really cool story. Purples work great because purple for shadow is just a great color, number one. Um, 
I would probably stay away from browns. Uh, only because browns aren't intense and vibrant enough. You want to stick to more vibrant colors, purples, reds, yellows, all of what you would consider like your base kind of primary-ish colors. Uh, yellows, oranges, uh, greens, uh, blues, but, you know, blue-blue, green-green, you know, not real dark blues. Uh, because those, of course, mixing with black doesn't have a big effect anyway. Um, but you can play around with them. And if you're painting off the brush and not the airbrush, you have a little bit more leeway because you can mix on the palette and see exactly and dial it how you want. If you wanted it to be dark blue with just a spot of black, you could get the same thing that we're going to get going the other direction with transparents. We're going to be using transparent black and need a lot more black with just a little touch of blue. But you can do it however you like. Right? You could do this with not transparent paints. You can use just our regular Procryl colors with it. I could have done this with probably uh, pyrrole red and coal black and just mix this color that way. And again, it would probably be um, you know, more black and a little bit of red to get this because we didn't want a whole lot of red in it. But you could then shift it however you'd like. Right? It's up to you. Right? And you can even come back in, like I've got a little bit in the cup right now. Uh, you could come back in with this if you wanted to before you rinse your airbrush out in this case. Right? I'm just going to go in here and get a little bit on the brush. Right? And I can get the same color now. Get a little bit of water on my brush. And if I wanted to just be able to detail in some areas that I didn't want to, you know, mess with, with getting in real close with the airbrush, I could come back in and kind of reinforce this, like right around here. If I want to have that reddish black really kind of, you know, have a more, uh, uh, what do we want to call that, pronounced presence in the dark, darkest recesses, then I can just come in just like we did before. And I can start adding back in, you know, some of that contrast this way. So completely flexible for however you'd like to use them. That's the great thing about the transparents is they literally let you get away with murder. You can paint with them exactly like a regular paint. They just give you that magic bullet of being able to create such a cool effect on the model for very little effort. Right. So I don't want to do too much of this because it's going to give us a real, it's going to uh, possibly give us some texture on here. But I just want to show you how you can come back in and reinforce that. So, and, and you don't even have to use the airbrush, right? You can see very quickly that I could be doing this instead of uh, the airbrush at all. Right? But I can come back in and layer these to get exactly the depth of red and black I want on here. It's up to me. Play with it. See what you like. Get the underside of that collar again. Now you got me going nuts. Now I'm looking at it and I'm saying, okay, this works pretty well. Right. So you can go dial in your colors as you need to. But now we've got that real nice warm black in the shadows, but it still reads as black. We haven't replaced black with red, but that's why you want to make sure that your shadows are very, very deep before you go in and overpaint. That's true of everything. If I were just painting over the top of this with green, I would want to make my, sure my shadows was as, as close to pure black as I could get them before layering green over the top of it. Because that green is going to brighten my shadows. Even if I use a really dark green, it's going to be brighter than black. And so you have to understand where you want your shadow balance to be. The same way when we go back over the top of this with the blue mixed with the black, we're going to need to understand how blue we want it to be. And you'll see how I layer it on. And Snowblind Cowboy, thank you so much for the follow. Grins, 36 freaking months. Thank you, my man. All right, so let's wash out the airbrush real quick. Do that over here on screen. Yeah, I was hoping you guys would like this just as opposed to, it's a fun way to paint blacks, number one. It seems complicated because it adds more steps, but the steps are all very easy. Nothing that I've shown you other than if you're trying to airbrush and you're not comfortable with airbrushing very close to the model and with that, um, you know, level of granularity and precision, then you can also do it with a brush. So nothing I've shown you is airbrush only. I try not to do that. Um, everything that we've done is able to be done with the brush. You just have to be able to control the thinness of the paint. So I think the most complex thing that I've, I've done right now is uh, using super thin paint. The transparents and the reason why we're doing this with transparents is because they're a lot easier to control the thinness of because they already start transparent. So you're not going to get into a position 
where uh, you know you you uh, put the transparents on the model and immediately ruin everything underneath it. You know, as long as you use even a little bit of water, the transparents are your friend. They make things a lot easier and more forgiving when doing top coats. Now they don't work for everything, right? If you're painting flesh, there's not a real good way to do the flesh with transparents over the top of white and black to really get what you want. Uh, if you're doing like Caucasian or African flesh or something like that, uh, you're gonna need opaque paints in order to pull that off. But for armor and things like that, you can underpaint and then use the transparents to achieve the colors that you're looking for very simply. All right, so I don't have to clean the airbrush super, super good. I just wanna make sure it's giving me less colored water out at this point. Good to go. So now we need to mix up, mix up some blue and black. And like I said on this, it's gonna be one drop of blue and a crap ton of black. All right, so we'll get out our blue, transparent blue. Grab our transparent black again, I just wherever I put it, put red away, we're done with you, and uh, go for it. Go to town. Mediocre, what color does the metallic medium dry to? Uh, exactly what you see in the bottle, it's like a white metallic, like platinum. Now here, unlike last time, I'm going to mix the paints first in the cup rather than put the flow improver in, so I don't forget and dump it all out. So again, I'm going to do one drop of blue this time instead of two drops like we did with the red. With the red, I wanted to be able to back it back down from the red that I want. With the black and blue, we don't want a lot of blue. We can add blue in later, as a matter of fact, as we go in and do our edge highlighting and things like that. So for now, we want to, with that one drop of blue, we'll do uh, how about one, two, three, four, five, and six again. How about that? So six to one instead of six to two on this might be good. As a matter of fact, let's just go seven and eight. Or that was like seven, eight, and nine. That one had a lot of air bubbles in it, so I don't know if that was a full drop or not. All righty, then we'll throw some flow improver on top of that. Way more paint than we need. Uh, but when mixing for color in the cup, you're going to be wasteful. You're pretty much going to be wasteful when mixing for new hues, no matter what you do. Even if you do it on the palette or in a small mixing device first. So now we should have what appears to be just pure black. We shouldn't read a whole lot of blue here. I think we're pretty good. Oh, that looks perfect. Okay, so you can see looks pretty black but what we're going to get right out of that black you can start seeing that coolness to it immediately right so watch as i go over this white see that but if i keep layering it right i get that nice kind of almost gunmetal blue and then keep layering it and keep layering it and keep layering it and i can get black out of it again with just a tint of blue to it so that's why you want to do it super thin so that you can layer like this without building up too much paint. Control how much of the black you see versus if you have too much blue in it, right? Then you're going to be fighting to get rid of blue, which might then make it too black in certain areas. So you got to find that nice balance if you're going to be doing this. All right, so here we go. We're going to paint the whole model this way. Uh, we don't care if we get a little bit in the shadows or whatever. Let's zoom in so you can see what's happening. All right, but this will be the color of our black. So just top down right now, you'll notice that it also cleans up any of the weirdness we may have had in our blends. We just want to give a nice, good, even coat to the model to start. Don't get, uh, don't go back in and start redoing other areas yet. If you feel like you missed something, go ahead and move away from it and go on to the next part. You can come back after these colors have dried. The way that the transparents work is that they will just keep layering. It's not like a wash or an ink where, you know, they won't start uh, adding to their opacity until you've let one base coat dry. Uh, these will just like regular paint. They will keep adding more and more color the more you keep spraying. Okay, so we want to just get a pretty good 
even first coat going like that. And bingo, that even right there works pretty good as black armor. Right? Doesn't take long for it to be set up. Then we want to hit the top again. We want to darken it up a bit. So I'm going to start adding a little bit more of this. I'm going to stay away from my brightest area. So I'm going to get in a little closer. Start hitting the areas right where our red ended. Side of the head, back of the head. Coming up out of the shadows, top of this arm over here that's kind of off on its own anyway. Basically a second coat everywhere, unless there's a spot that didn't really, uh, might have been too dim when we started. And so if we hit it with the first layer and it almost knocked out all of my highlights, then we won't hit that area again. But everything here was pretty consistent, right? So we're just gonna continue to go after it all. Just make sure there aren't any areas where there isn't one of those two colors sitting on it, right? We do want blue and or red mixed with black everywhere. Because at this stage, if you miss a spot, you're not going to be pleased with uh, what you're left with, right? that ridicule what what ridicule what is going on man good to see you i actually went hunting for you on twitch about a month ago trying to find because i saw somebody playing one of those weird catch em games that you play and so i said i wonder if he's streaming and i went and tried to find him so i hope you're in chat i hope you're hearing me hope you're doing well man good to see you Yep, Jen's like, blast from the past. Ridicule was one of the guys we played World of Tanks with for so long. Great guy. Just dump him in noil, null oil and have it be done. But then you don't get this, right? Right? And again, just play and, and decide for yourself where you want that blue to live, right? How much blue do you really want? Because you can always layer up again. Just realize that every time I put another layer of paint on him to push it more towards black, I am also dimming all of my highlights down if I'm not careful. So I'm gonna come in and hit this right along the midline of the shoulder plate and not on the top. See how I did that? So I maintain the shine at the top of the shoulder plate but I've got this, uh, the transparent living in the mid-range. Same thing on these gloves, backpack, not gonna go right across the top there, just kinda. Darken that knee up a little bit. That inside thigh a little bit, that stomach piece. Now I can start playing with value, knocking brightness down. Blending back some of my highlight areas, although I'm really, really happy with this. Looking pretty good. Right. 
and bingo. Now we've got black armor. But we've given that black armor enough of a color that we aren't just stuck with black and gray. Okay, and that's really the whole gist of what we've been doing here today and Tuesday is showing you how easy it is to get the feel of black, right? Tell the story of black armor, but not be forcing yourself into painting with just black, gray, possibly white, you know, all of that. We'll let it cure for a second, sit here and gab a bit, then we'll come back after it. Yeah, Mediocre got to come to the office and see these actual models. And the first thing he says, like everybody says, is holy crap. You know, they look so much better in person, right? But there you go. Set it next to some color. And now you can start seeing how, as you create blacks, you really do get the feel of black. But black as it exists in the real world. Remember that as you look around, there's very little in your world that is black, black as a black, you know, as black paint is. Everything shows some color, especially the shinier it gets. It absorbs, or not absorb, wrong word, but it reflects all the color in its environment and owns that, right? So you get, like, I'm looking around my desk right now and I've got, you know, glossy black camera clamps and, and light poles and you know, these lamps over here. And everywhere I look, there's a variance of color in them. This one's reflecting the pink of my glass. That one's reflecting the blue of this Altoids can, right? So I've got all these colors in all of what is supposedly black. And so when you really sit back, you can be like, oh, black isn't just black paint and finding a way to highlight that. Now we can get this, and that's black armor, right? So we start doing details on him. If you, if you don't want to use like a color on the top, you could just use black and not switch it to blue, but use the red underneath. Use the blue in the shadows and just the black on the top, just black in the shadows and red on the top. You can see how you can start playing with your colors and create all sorts of interesting movements in your black and that the real key, what makes this look the way it does, is all the time we spent painting white and gray and black as a pre-highlight, pre-shade. Okay, that's it. 99.9% .9 of what we are seeing right now on this model, as far as what it has visual intensity from, is the underpainting. Right? And then we'll go back and we'll start edge highlighting all this. And by edge highlighting, through our edge highlighting, we'll get to the point where we're like, yes, <laughs> you know, this is going to look superb. And it's very easy to reproduce, right? We've done a lot of extra steps, like I said at the beginning of the show, uh, as we've gone through and shown multiple ways to kind of do every step we've done so far. So we kind of amalgamated a lot of things and took extra steps when we didn't have to. When we first started this, we literally just painted the model black primer, uh, went in and uh, uh, did the, uh, the white pre-highlight, and then did the, the edge highlighting for that and the pure white paint off the brush to bump up all of our highlights. And you could have been done with it, the model at that point, and then done this stuff we did today. So technically, without too much more time than what we've spent today, we could have already done 100% of what you see, especially if you're not streaming, right? Um, so it doesn't take a lot of time, and you can recreate stuff like this very, very quickly for an entire army by just doing the, the black primer, the pre-highlight with the airbrush. Uh, you can't really do that with rattle can and get it good because you don't want to see that texture. Do it with the airbrush. You get those gray mid-tones and that bright white up on top. Then you take the brush and you do all your edge highlighting because we can still find all those edge highlights on here, right? Even though they've dimmed down, right, we still have them. Now those edge highlights are this mid-tone color, which is perfect because now we'll come back after all of those highlights with just bright neutral gray, and we've already got that mid-tone kind of blended highlight that we like so much, right? And the, the bright neutral gray later, later over the top of this will look like a punch of white and will basically be like the finish for highlighting. We won't have to do a whole lot. So at the root of it, while it may seem like it's super complicated, the steps all, once you think about them, they all make sense and they all become very, very simple. Lazy Dargan, thank you so much. It's just that mental gymnastics of taking things that you don't normally associate with a model until the very end, edge highlighting. We don't normally do until the very end. Now you're doing it at the beginning, right? So you did black primer, white overspray for your pre-highlight, your zenithal, if you want to call it that. You do your zenithal, and then you edge highlight everything in bright white, <laughs> right? Then you do the overpaint, right? Now we went back and did some mid-tone stuff on there to make all of these mid-tone colors. Notice how we shift from like this pale uh, gray blue to this almost like like uh, deep, deep, uh, 
uh, what would we call that, almost like a jade color in there because we had that brownish gray that I put in. So I've done some other things here to play around with hues. You don't have to do that, right? You can literally just have the grays and whites and blacks that are made from the zenithal highlight over the black primer, the bright edge highlighting that you did, the spot highlighting on the shoulders that bump those up in the top of the head, and then go and, and glaze the black red and the black blue over the top of this and done. Do it off a whole army and be done in a day. It's super simple. <laughs> it's super simple. We've just taken a lot of time to talk about every single step. Ridicule. Thank you, man. Now let's have Jen do it for her bases. Oh, zombie brush. You got to start. She's going to eat you alive, man. The thing that with Jen is that she literally says, the more you talk about it, the less I'll ever do it. That's what she's on right now. That's what she's on right now. <laughs> All right, so we've let it sit here and cure while we've babbled. We just need to make sure that we get back in here and there isn't any area that's kind of off balance with color. I probably don't want the inside of that foot in there to be quite that bright. It's actually brighter right now than the out step of this one, which is closer to our light source. So let's get a little bit of color and let's hit the in step of that foot again. Like that. Just another quick layer in there. We'll darken that stuff up a bit. Perfect. Everywhere else looks pretty good. Maybe a little bit less brightness on the belt right there. I like that arm. I like the inside there. Get his collar a little bit more. So just look around, poke around and make sure you don't have any area that stands out as being too bright that shouldn't be. But I'm pretty happy with that right now. Head and shoulders still remain the brightest part of the body on that. And now we can start edge highlighting. I mean, it's that quick. Ta-da! <laughs> I mean, ta-da! We can... Oh, it sucks. I'm wasting so much paint here. Well, there you go. Let loose that. Remember, on this coat, it was a lot more black than blue. One drop of blue and a ton of black. I think we did eight drops of black with the blue and then a bunch of flow improver. And we still got that kind of blue because the white punching up through there is going to find the most vibrant color that you're spraying over it, even if it's in a mix, and force it to the top. So even though we have way more black in this mix, the blue is what's going to be visible anytime you hit it over bright grays or white. So just take that into account and be careful how you mix your top coat colors. Because, you know, 50-50 uh, blue and black may look good on the palette, but as soon as you spray it, you're going to be unhappy. In most cases, you're going to get blue <laughs> and not so much black. So be careful. You could also just do, if you wanted to stay safe, we hadn't talked about this, but if you wanted to be safe and do these things. Arch, what is going on, man? Good to see you. Two months. Uh, you don't even have to mix these, technically. You could very spray very thin, black, transparent, over the whole model after having done just blue transparent and red transparent, right? So you could put red transparent right over the shadows with a brush or with airbrush, and then blue transparent really thin over the whole model. It'll look like a weird American flag, right? Because you'll have really punchy reds and really punchy blues, and then you can do uh, black transparent over the top of all of that. So you don't technically have to mix them. I just prefer mixing them in cases like this because I feel like you get a more controlled color output that hits every area exactly the same. You alleviate that problem of building up too much red, too much blue in a certain area, and then being forced to uh, use so much black to get it where you want to that you might overdo that area with black. So a little easier to mix them uh, in the color control category, but might not be the safest thing for you to do or the most confident thing that you're wanting to do if you haven't done this before. So feel free to play around with it. You know, as you glaze colors, you can filter one color over another and do it six times and get really amazing results. We just chose to do basically one. You have a wild hair experiment with painting some Alpha Legion. Wild hair exper to experiment with painting some Alpha Legion? Oh, I see. You have a, I am sitting here reading it as you're having like a bad hair day, but you're saying, I have a wild hair up my butt to experiment with paint. I get it now. I get it now. Zombie brush. Your wife is stubborn. Almost as stubborn as a Spanish Nazi table from Elvis Bastage. That's a good thing that you've picked up the torch on that one, I suppose. 
I mean, where would we be if we only had to rely on Siobhan for that? <laughs> Zombie. Oh, really, Grins? I don't play any video games these days. I go on stents where I'm, like, bored and if my brain's going numb at the very beginning of, uh, of uh, all of the... Uh, the lockdown stuff, I got a little rage-induced and needed to go play some video games. All right, looks really good. All right, so let's put the airbrush tools away. Don't need the flow improver on anymore. What we do need is to paint the eyes. Uh, Raven Guard, what color are Raven Guard eyes? Raven Guard, are they just all red? Is that what I'm about to find out? Is if you're painting Space Marines, the lenses are red? I don't know. I feel like everything I look at from GW is red lenses. Should we do a different color? Should we do like purple lenses? Since we have red and blue on the model, we could do like purple lenses would be kind of nifty instead of just red on all of them. We could do green lenses on the... Oh, green would be pretty bitchin', huh? Because we're going to do red uh, on the guns, or on the gun and the sword again. We're doing all the, the casings. So we do green. I think green sounds like a good idea, right? Green? Because, yeah, everything on the internet is red. Mo says blue. Zombie says magenta. The Baltimore Raven Guard. Red, purple. Get some of that purple in there. It says tankers again. Purple could be cool. Yeah. Yeah, purple, I think, is a good answer. All right, purple it is. Let's do it. I want to I'm going to remember to paint the eyes first. So dark purple first. Bam. Last time or the last couple of well, the only other two marines we've painted <laughs> along this journey, we messed up and we did the eyes very late. I was very lucky and I was able to get all the eyes done without messing up all of the work we did around the rest of the helmet, but I feel like our luck will run out eventually, right? Eventually, we won't be able to say that. Get a little bit of dark purple out. We'll get a little bit of purple out. Dark purple, purple magenta. Yes, even on eyes, it's worth three colors. And probably even some pale pink. I say it's worth three colors. We may not get three colors on there, but we're gonna try. And a little bit of pale pink. Uh, where's my number two? All right. Camera, are we going to have a fight again? Are we doing this? Is that what today is? Just like we talked about when freehanding a design, don't try to paint the whole eye in one direction. Paint from one corner of the eye to the center and then turn it around and paint from the other corner of the eye to the center. So you're not taking your brush stroke so far that it gets a uh, paint where you don't want it.
Purple, purple. I think the purple's a good idea. It's not going to be as, well, after the magenta, it may be as in your face as the other colors, but right now I'm really digging it. Just try to leave a dark ring around it so like everything else I'm just highlighting into the inside of the eye as much as I can. I want to get as magenta magenta as I can. Amp up the pinch of the eye closest to the nose. Without making it look too much like an iris. Still want to have it blend out a little bit. And then, uh, oh, we're going to use bright pink or pale pink. Nearly got two teeny weeny dots out of that. Not quite. Round two. Come on, brush. You know you wanna. All right, eyes. Now we get into uh, edge highlighting. Hope everybody's week is going great. It is Thursday. We call this Therapy Thursday around here. So if you have any particular life questions that you'd like to ask me, I'm your guy. Therapist is in, right? Bad life advice is cheap here. So if you want to know how to best break up with your boyfriend or girlfriend or both, I got answers. <laughs> uh, 
All right. All right. Let's think about this. Uh, we also need to be thinking about uh, framing in all of this other stuff. What is, uh, I'm assuming Raven Guard, I closed the tab. I'm assuming they have silver livery instead of um, gold, right? We've been doing non-metallic gold. Yeah, they're all silver, right? Like the chest Aquila and Imperialis are all silvers. Well, look at that. Well, look at that. Would you look at that? How'd he create it? What the hell? 14 months. What's going on, man? Yeah, there's silver on the Imperialis. White, uh, white livery markings. Sorry, I didn't mean to say livery. So the, the, uh, the Raven Guard logo, white on black field. Uh, we were going to do this in black metallic trim on this shoulder, red metallic trim on this shoulder, uh, and then silver on the chest plate. Correct. But we'll do a little bit of outlining, a little bit of edge highlighting. We're just going to go in directly with bright neutral gray. We could. You're, you would have the choice to be able to do uh, right now uh, like gray blue. You could do a, a nice pale blue for your edge highlight if you wanted to. Uh, we have a good blue sitting on here right now so for our black armor. So I don't really want to have uh, any more blue on the edging. I think we found everything we need just directly on the, the mid-tones right now. So neutral gray it is. Fairly thin. I want to build these up slowly. And even use my finger to kind of bump that edge down a little bit. And just start finding those edges again. Being careful not to uh, overdo any of them. We don't want to get the whole edge for hardly any of these. Things like this. Let's just go in here and we'll get... this cylindrical shine on his thigh plate. So we'll just peek a little brightness out at the very bottom.
this is one of those where you don't want to overdo it because you will start to blow out all of your mid-tones if you start going too bright with any of your highlight that you're doing right now. Right. So you want to be able to come back to why I'm using this fairly thin so I can come back and like bang out this corner, make that a little bit brighter than the surrounding area. It basically acts like my white if I play this right, even though I'm not using white. And then I still have the ability to go to white should I need to. If I need a little bit of extra punch someplace, I can find it. Depends on how shiny I want all this stuff to look. All right, the gray will do a good job of getting me some shine on these edges. But at the end of the day, isn't the, uh, the brightest value that we could throw on here. So it gives us a lot of leeway to be able to still push it further should we need to. like in all of these we've got this cylindrical shine here i'm going to pick the side right here and create our brightest reflection right along there just by poking a bunch of little dots and then that t that we need right is that that bright spot hits the edge just like everywhere else make sure it goes along that edge just for a little bit then on the boot here the toe we've got a little bit of shine that's going to tee at the top because we've got this shine on this edge so it's going to reflect downwards so we've got a straight line across there then we use again a bunch of little presses of the brush to make a line this way and then we'll get a little bit of our shine going across the toe of the boot with our brightest spot right where that connects And now, real simple, we start to pick out the metallic or, you know, just the, the shiny bits that we're going to want here. This is the eye test, so to speak. Kind of don't like the way that edge just bluntly ends there. So I'm going to swipe at this real gently to get that edge to continue on and then hit it with my finger. So again, this is, is very simple because you've already, through all your other work, you've already told yourself where you're painting everything right now. I'm not having a guess, right? <clears throat> I've got this, this light blue, right, right here that comes down and provides the shine on the cylinder of the leg because that's where we put it. And now I just need to come back in and, and grab a little bit of this bright gray right along here as well. Set it right inside these colors. And maybe a little bit right there. Same thing over here. Just kind of pull my line down. Notice how thin my paint is. Make sure that that brightness runs along this edge for a split second. It's a little too thin. If it starts pooling up like that, just wipe it off. Start over. There we go. Just set that T of color inside so I still have that haze of light blue around it. You don't want to overtake any of that. I still need that glow 
of this light blue or light gray blue, you know, whatever it is that that uh, black and blue transparent created for us. We want to make sure that that still exists on the model. So you're just taking very, very light brush strokes to find a way to filter your bright color right inside of those. And now I'm picking up, I'm still seeing a lot of that red with the black as I'm going in and doing this. It's really cool. A little bit on the heel here. Try to get these edges where we've got other openings in the armor facing back towards our light source. And the only thing that's time consuming about this is all the little panel lines and doodads on Space Marines. But it ain't that bad. A little bitty pinprick of brightness right on the top of that corner there, maybe. Same here. That's barely any paint at all. Don't want to brighten that up because that pushes up underneath into the shadow of the body. Same here, we just get a little shine on this corner. Like so. Like that. Just catch this edge of this butt plate. highlight down the edge there then we had this secondary shine coming vertically down here so I probably want to catch just a little speck of brightness right where those vertical shine lines hit the edge I'm not even going to run them along the edge there by taking your brush if you're on a sharp edge like that by taking your brush and applying light pressure at first and then heavy pressure and just going towards the edge it flares out the that little spot so we get a little triangle of light there and it works perfectly so you don't even have to worry about it just flick your brush at it real quick and you get those little dots now see how we've got shiny black armor on that greave down there you have this friend who refuses to admit he loves a particular film i don't even know what you're talking about Never heard of it, or him, or you. <laughs> Uber Tolucci says, what about if you broke up with a girl over five years ago and then you go out with one of her friends? Is that okay? Hell yes. I mean, not just yes, but hell yes, right? Hell yes. No better way in the world to say, look, see what you're missing, <laughs> than to show back up into your ex's life five years down the road dating one of their friends. <laughs> Bad life advice, check. <laughs> you can't direct your, your love though. I'm a big fan of that, right? It's like if you happen to meet somebody out, you really like them and they're friends and you're in that group, it's like, I, it might be awkward, but this is cool, so I'm not gonna quit. Oh, I see what's going on in chat. I, I see what you people are doing. You're not able to hide that from me. You do realize I'm reading chat, right? <laughs> I mean, you do realize, right? You do realize. Even though I get tunnel vision and I'm sitting here painting dudes. I'm just randomly move, moving around this model, so no rhyme or reason. Just pick where you want to paint next. And
again, real thin with the gray so that it sits in there and doesn't have like a real brash, you know, wrecking the party feel to it when you get that brightness in there. But it starts setting you up for how it's going to look. That arm already looks 100 times better just with three little spots of paint. Do the same thing. We've got this, this line coming down the cylinder, so I'm going to carry that on. It's going to hit. It's going to down here at that little panel, and it's going to come down onto the wrist here, and then onto this cuff. All right. Chad Michael Taylor. What is going on, Chad? Good to see you. Tremere, thank you so much. 37 months, four months. Thank you, thank you, thank you, guys. Welcome back. I know, Doka. I don't know where you got that wild hair up your butt that I'm not sitting here reading chat. Right. And welcome, everybody. If you're just hanging out for the first time, lurking in the background, we are painting black armor for our Raven Guard today. We've gone through the steps of underpainting, and today we've now gone over and filtered our red, black, and blue, black over the top of it to get this cool kind of uh, nice, rich, deep black going on there that gives us this kind of blue gray up towards our highlight spots. And uh, we're going in right now, starting at the feet and working our way up with all of our shiny stuff using uh, bright neutral gray. Uh, if you're not familiar with our paints, we make this wonderful paint called Proacryl. And you can do exclamation point store to find it. Give us a chance to uh, become your favorite paint ever because we are so many other people's favorite paint ever already, including mine. Jeez, have I spoken to you about how much I like Procryl lately? All right, so we do want to bring a little bit of that shine along these edges on this arm, elbow, uh, and forearm at least, around the back here. So we've got, we'll have a little bit of brightness right in here. And I'm going to stitch a little bit of shine into that shadow area, too, with just some dots. More dots. And same thing with this edge here, just to break up the monotony of the darkness back here, because we do have some other shine on other panels. And same thing. I don't want to carry it too much further than I've decided to do the elbow. Same general shape. This little, whatever this is, pin prick of light right there just to pick up that indention in the armor plate. All right, that fits a lot better with what we have back here. Hair thin line to pick up that shine on the cylinder there. And then I'm going to get it here as well. So I'll have two shine spots on that cuff one from the reflection from the raised panel, and one from just the general lighting running down the cylinder of his arm. Easy peasy. Don't need much on the inside of the arm. All the details out here. Moving right along. Feel like that's a Kermit the Frog song. Moving right along. Am I right, chat? I feel like I'm right, chat. Nah. A brighter highlight on that belt just along the upper edges. Remember, we've already got that light blue from our previous work taking care of most of the heavy lifting for our edge highlight, so we don't want to go too far overboard. It 
It's right. It's from it's from uh, like the Muppet movie or something, right? Moving right along. I don't know the other words. Fozzy Bear. Yes. And the Studebaker. Yes. Mediocre says, I want to hear more of Kermit singing, please. <laughs> I feel like I can do, because he's got kind of a, a weird whiny tinge to his voice, right? Without whining. Is that a good way to describe? Fozzie Bear is waka, waka, waka. <laughs> oh, don't get me started. So good. So good, the Muppets. Are you kidding me, people? Gonzo, he was a Muppet, right? Gonzo, the great Gonzo. Everybody's now Googling, moving right along. and wishing that we still had music in the stream so that everybody could go request said video. And we'd just be listening to moving right along for the rest of the stream, right? On Space Marines, I do the belt as being metal too, or some sort of color, on centered color thing rather than brown belt, that make any sense to me, but whatever. Little brightness right at the bottom of the shine line on the stomach plate here. Just paint a little bitty triangle of color. Make sure it goes a little bit racing along that edge, like so. Same thing over here, except we won't go along the edge. We're just going to get a dot of paint right there, and we're going to put one right up here where we have this reflection from whatever sword, I don't know, on the upper chest plate piece, reflecting down. We we'll do the same thing over here. We've got a little bit of light hitting right along this edge here, which is maybe going to cause a little bit of a shine right there. We can have that kind of race along this edge maybe a little bit. Question mark? Dash dot dash. I like that. That works. Same thing here. I'm just going to do a little dot of brightness right along each one of these little grill openings. I gotta get a little bit of the top edge of each of the grill openings right where that dot is. Like so. Typically when I'm doing this, hopefully you can see like the, the way that I'm looking at it is every shine I put on, I look at, okay, what's that shining onto? Right? So like if I do this dot here, does that go here? Okay, if that goes there, then how am I doing this? And then that goes here and so on and so forth. And then that's how I just kind of migrate around the model as opposed to, you know, looking at it and being like, oh, you know, uh, let's just paint here. And that's I just kind of start in a spot like I'll start right here and say, OK, let's do a line of brightness on this knee plate. That line of brightness means that I've got that same kind of light hitting along that same vertical line of the cylinder of his leg. Right. So I'll do like that. Maybe a little brightness right there. Maybe a little bit right there. Maybe get a little bit right in here. Like so. And then maybe find just a little bit of shine. Blur that with my finger. Coming down there. Even though I didn't have that already on the model because I wasn't thinking that it didn't really match up for why there's a shine right here. It doesn't always have to. Sometimes you've got shapes that kick out away from the model that won't have any reflection back and forth on other parts. 
and sometimes you just want to see a little bit more brightness in an area to give some contrast visually. So again, we want to run that light where it hits an edge. Just kind of gently run the brush until that edge fades away. Like so. We have that shine on the cylinder of this extended thigh plate, so we need to, and we have it here as well, so we just need to tap it a little bit in here as well. And they're not in line with one another because one of them stands proud of the other, right? So you have a dimensional change, so the shine won't be a straight line. Make sure you don't do that, right? The shine will be here inside on the low part and then jump up and run outside on the other part. Make sure we get some brightness on the top here. Do just a little pin prick of brightness on the knee where it pokes out. Real thin with the gray right now, and just poke it on there. Blur it with my finger real quick. Then I can go get some gray that's not quite as thin and literally just poke a dot towards the upper side of that circle we just made, like so. to get the shine on the knee. I do need a little bit of uh, this line on the underside of this kneecap thing. Bingo. Once this one's dry, I'm going to get a little bit of a top of an eyelid kind of shape going on here. I'm going to bring the shine off of this little circle just a hair's breadth to either side. We got this stuff down here, we can get a little bit of brightness poked in. Again, this is just kind of finding corners. All right, don't really need any there. Pick it back up down low where we've got the shine on the boot. So we've already got that pre set up. So we just kind of tap our brightness along this outer edge of that mid tone that we've got, and then run it along the edge of the armor plate there a little bit. You see me do this all the time. This is just the same stuff over and over and over again. Right. Needs more gray on the palette. Jen says, I love you. <laughs> Why? Because I because I remember the Muppet movie. <laughs> and I'm ready to sing Muppet songs. I feel like every time you sing Muppet songs, you got to do this. Put your hands up. It's more fun if you go like this. Repray, the Smurf looks awfully dark. Dude, do you tune in like once a week? <laughs> Smurf is done. Dark Angel is done. This is Raven Guard now. We do black armor now. You're two models behind, man. All right, so uh, what was I doing? This thing down here. What's going on, Refray? How you been? I think I even changed the title of the stream, didn't I? I feel like I did.
For those of you who may not know what I'm doing, I, uh, I go in and remove most of the material on my thumb so that when I go to the model, I'm not overloaded with paint. Um, even when I'm not painting super thin. Like right now, I'm not painting with ultra thin paint, right? It's not glazing or anything. You know, I can make a nice dot and it stays as a dot. It doesn't spread out like that. Um, but I don't want to have so much material that if I do a little bit too much pressure that it fans that paint way out. You know, because I'm really controlling everything right now with line width. Really thin, poking a lot at the model, right? Using that stippling to get the paint where I want it. Like that, stip a little bright dot there. Now I've got to pick up a little bit of the shine because if I have a shine here, that creates a light source. So that's why we have this on the shin, even though this is all down here in shadow, right? We're going to have a little bit of a dim reflection of that metal on the boot hitting back up against the shin. So we just do that real quick as we're running out of paint on the brush so that the paint is not very vibrant. It's the last paint this brush has right now. So it'll be the dimmest that that gray gets. Okie doke. We can do a little bit more on the instep of this foot here as well. Can even get like a little spot of color right back here on this ankle thingy a jigger. barely any paint left on the brush at all so it should work perfectly we're not looking for a lot of shine but just to pick up that texture right because of the texture that level change that detail that there is that disc back there just a little dot of paint back there does a lot of work right, but it keeps that leg looking pretty dark but gives us that metallic shine that we're looking for and look at how different everything below the waist looks versus the, the like out of focus upper body that we've done right it starts bringing everything into focus starts placing all those colors the bluishness that we got on the metal starts making sense that reddish in the shadows really starts popping through right we get a really good look and slowly but surely we take that all the way up the model Paul Kerr, what is going on? Thank you so much for the follow. Paul Johns, what's going on? You've been hot and busy? <laughs> Need to catch up and paint some Marines. Karate, what is going on, my man? Good to see you. I know you were asking about black armor. So good to see you in chat. Some hot red flames on the beaky mask. You know, it would actually be really cool, wouldn't it, Ray? You do like black like this and you do like hot rod flames or something, you know. Something cool and chopperish. Uber Tolucci, I love you too. <laughs> I love you too. Here, do I'm supposed to do polka dots? Where? Mo says, so I'm assembling Chief Librarian Tigurius. Just realize he's doing the staying alive John Travolta stay almost right. I think his hand is a little lower, but yes, but yes. Electric Mayhem and Doctor Teeth. What? What? Fozzie was the OG of dad jokes. This is true. This is true. Is Dr. Teeth one of the band guys? With Animal? Because didn't Animal play drums? I always really liked the chick in the, in the band. I don't think she had eyes. Or if she had eyes, they were just like, like always closed. Like she just had like eyelashes. Right? Am I thinking right? She had one of the small domed heads, all mouth, very little head, very little forehead, right? He was the leader. Yeah, 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 the Muppet Bay. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So good. So was her name, Squeezel, was her name Janice? Oh, how awesome is that? Yeah, was he the guy that played the piano? Dr. Teeth? Only eyelids. Yeah, 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 yeah. She was so good. She was always like talking like this. Dude, the Muppets, man. 
The Muppets, how can you deny that the Muppets were like one of the greatest things of all time? All right, so we need to find a shine here. So I'm just going to do it like right here. For no good reason. I don't know. I don't know because I need something there. And I've got this shine that's going to hit right on the corner up here on the thigh. Turn that corner just a little bit. And then that's going to give us that reflection is going to give us just a little bit up here. Maybe. And then that's probably offline where it should be for this knee, but whatever. I don't want to force it up too far underneath the gun, right? This is one of those that it's like doesn't always have to make sense. It just has to get the job done sometimes. And I am painting very thin right now because I know I'm in an area that is really more shadow than anything. So the, the more I thin this gray out, the more I can be assured that as I get this line on here, it'll dim itself down as it cures. But it still gives me that metallic feel that I'm looking for up in there. And that's right. What it really wants, unfortunately, well, maybe not unfortunately. Maybe I can get my finger in there and blur this. Let's see. Let's give it a shot. What it really wants is a little bit of a cylindrical shine right in there. And I can't get any of my fingers in there. Maybe? Nah. Nah. Eh. The gray's thin enough. That probably works. I want to get a little of this edge, even though it probably didn't make a whole lot of sense, just because I like bringing this detail out on Marines. And that gives us a little bit of shine right in here. And just stipple a little bit of secondary color up underneath. Whenever you have a sphere, right, it has the ability to redirect light from 360 degrees in its environment. So we have a little bit of a dim line that follows along the shine of the greave underneath it. Just a little shine there. Get a little bit of reflection right here at the corner of this because of, you don't know, the rocks on the ground. That's actually a thing. Light bouncing off the ground back up into the inner thigh and feet area. We'll give you some shine that might be a little unexpected. That's fine. I'm liking all of that. Let's move on to the chest. You know, I knew a guy in school that was the spitting image of animal. Hair and all, really? <laughs> I don't know if that's a great thing for a human being, but that's fun. That's fun. It's like, uh, it's like the dude from Fast Times at Ridgemont High. I feel like they did such a great job, the Muppets. Jim Henson and all them of just portraying such an amalgam of awesome personalities. You had everything. You had the very stoic, the bald eagle who was the news guy. He was always like stick up his butt. Hilarious. The old dudes that were heckling him from the theater seats. Swedish chef. 
always a good time. Hit the squirrely, squirrely, squirrely. <laughs> Again, not pulling that whole line, doing a little bit of start right up here, then don't do anything in the middle, then catch it again at the corner. Make sure I come around that corner because it's nice and round just to get a little bit of dimension and detail on this as it rolls into the bottom side of the chest. I can even grab a little bit of the edge where we've got these shine spots that we've created on the lower plates. Just grab that edge for a little bit in each of those spots. Pretty good. I have very, very little paint on my brush right now. And so it's a really good time to start doing things like, oh, I don't know, these details inside here where I don't want to overload too much paint. I can start using it more like a dry brush almost. If I do an entire stream, what way? Like Swedish chef? I don't know. Does he have enough words? Muppets were super legit. Yeah, right? <laughs> One of your favorite shows. We're showing our age, right? Although Muppets have made comebacks from time to time. It's like Fraggle Rock, right? Was another one that he did, right? I think that was also a Jim Henson production was Fraggle Rock. And it was probably, I mean, I feel like Fraggle Rock was probably a little bit more kid focused, even though Muppets were intended that way, but did enough adult, you know, well, you can't say adult content anymore because that might as well be X-rated, I think. Thank you. Apocalypse, what is going on? Thank you for that host. Welcome back. How you been? Fraggle Rock, right? I don't think he didn't have any words. I think you could do it. In fact, I triple dog dare you to for Swedish chef. I feel like we could probably do that. Lose all of our viewers instantaneously. So I was watching this guy paint, and I think he was having a stroke. There was this old guy on Twitch, and I feel like I joined right when he was dying. <laughs> I kept asking if he was smelling almonds. Punch a little brightness right up at the top of the chest there. JP Gray, what is going on, man? <laughs> 28 freaking months. What is happening, my man? Squall, what is happening, Squall? Like Looney Tunes, you laugh at the silliness when you're little, and as an adult, you get it all. <laughs> you understand it. It's like, wait a minute. This makes sense now. Especially things like foghorn, leghorn, right? I saw, I saw, I saw, I saw you. Come here, boy. Oh, 
I'll say right, right, right about now is where you going to paint the edge, boy. I'm a chicken hawk. like I'm really really thin yep I'm way too thin <laughs> way too thin with the paint every now and then you just know right that's why again you go test on your thumb first I'm like I put it over here and I'm like okay no it's not and by the time I get to the model I'm like I should probably be honest with myself and realize that was not the right consistency at all see how lightly I'm doing this so that I just build up paint slowly up towards the edge so I get that faded edge without having to use a bunch of different colors I get that shadow of like the beak draping across the edge there I don't know that it would be that that brash or that uh, visible of a shadow but whatever creates a neat contrast right along here This part takes probably the longest amount of time when painting models, period, if you're doing shiny stuff, because you're taking so much time making sure that your edges, you know, have the right line thickness. This is something that when I first turned my portfolio as a 2D artist to my first review in the comic book world at a comic book convention, and I gave it over and hand, I don't even remember who I handed it to. I think it's one of the Kubert brothers, believe it or not. Is that Could that be right? It could be. Somebody important that I was too stupid to realize as a kid how important they were in the comic book world. And, uh, and I got told very quickly that my line work had no, had no body to it. I don't remember what the words were, but you would go in and your line thickness was the same. Because you're focused so much at some point in time as a young artist whether you're paint, and I don't mean young like you're young. I'm old. I'm 50 years old. I still make mistakes. But, you know, if you're, if you're starting something, you're new at a particular technique, a lot of times you're focused in on getting the technique right, and you miss some of the nuances that actually make the technique work. And so for, like, 2D art, a lot of it has to do in various line thicknesses. You can thicken your line as you go into shadows. It gives you depth and volume to it because it creates a shadow. If you're, if you're assuming you're drawing in, like, black ink or something like that. So if you look at comic books, it's a good way to look. Uh, you'll find that there aren't a whole lot of spaces where the line is the same thickness. But you don't look at the picture thinking about that necessarily. You look at it finding those volumes and those contrasts. But then when you dive into it, you realize, oh, those volumes and those contrasts are coming because these lines are largely changing dimension. They get really thin, and it makes it look like it's blending with something. They get really thick, and it makes it look like it's shading something. Right, or you cross hatch, and where you have a lot of cross hatches very narrow and close together, it gets darker because there's more lines on the paper. Same thing with what we're doing here. So we spend so much time thickening and making our lines thin so that they have that, that volume on the model that gives the shapes and the dimensions life. In this case, light and the way it interacts and shines. So some things I paint solid, some things I'm doing just hairline, some things I'm doing just a little dot, sometimes I'm doing a lot. So that's where it takes all of the time is because I'm really focusing in and looking at every individual shape and how it relates to the shapes next to it and saying, okay, this one gets small, this one gets big. You can't just mindlessly, I mean, you can, you can just go through and edge everything to get it done quick. So there's a, there's a get it done quick, get it on the table, just do it, just do these lines, right? And then there's the when you focus in and you get that line to taper just so. So it's very, very thin out where it's dark and it gets very, very thick, or not very thick, but thicker as it gets towards the bright area when you're doing your edge highlights, and that makes all the difference. It changes the look of your entire model versus if you just do one thickness of line, one line pressure. You just put the brush on there and you go line because it's going to be the same thickness start to finish. Or it's even going to be worse. It's going to go thick, thin, thick, thin because you were just kind of wherever you turned it, right, you just kind of sketched it on. But if you take the time and you find those dimensions to those lines and you get it like up here on the collar, thicker up here at the top, and then narrow and really thin and taper off to nothing as it gets close to his beak, I just created that shadow on the collar without painting a shadow because that line reinforced darkness and brightness where I need them. So you can move the eye around the model in particular ways with your edge highlighting. It's just being focused and not just 
line, 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 right? Do lines thin, do lines thick, do one line really thin, then go back over it for half of it to thicken it up, and then half of that to thicken that up. You do it all any way you want to. Just as you start thinking about it, you start finding new ways to enhance your model that are actually really simple techniques. They're nothing you can't already do. It's just putting a little bit more uh, thinking and thought process to it as you get to that stage. When I count bits and we throw money at <laughs> Busting up the, the bit OCD. There used to be a lot of bit OCD on this channel. Repray says he'll send me a bag of Swedish berries. I don't even know what that is. It sounds horrible, but it might be great. Swedish berries. Is that a sex toy? <laughs> Look, I don't know what I'm getting myself into here. hoot ka -doo. We're, I don't think we're, we're at the point in our lives where an entire stream uh, pretending to be Swedish chef is doable. But I'm, I'm game for trying anything once, some things twice. thick on the top of that ear. Also feel like I'm a little thin with my paint, so I just add a little bit more paint on there. The shine on the nose that I like so much. One of the reasons I love beaky helmets. So literally just a ton of small lines. I don't want to draw a line down his nose. I want to do a lot of little hash marks. Don't care if the line's not perfectly straight. That gives it the feel that it's got dents and dings in it anyway. I need a uh, saran wrap or I'm going to start rubbing paint off because my hands are sweating. I'm getting all nervous and stage fright, guys. I don't know what to do. Wah. Wah. This is your hobby. I don't want to think. I do that enough the rest of the day. <laughs> well, there you have it. That's fine. You don't got to think. There's no rules to this thing we call miniature art. You can do what you want. The nice thing about the way I tell you to think is that you only got to do it a couple times, and then it becomes like riding a bike, right? You just It's what you do. I don't think too much about it. I have to think more about painting um, now that we teach on the Internet you know, so for the past five or so years, however long we've been doing this uh, on Twitch, I have learned to think more about my painting than I ever did because it just gets mindless for you at some point, right? You just, you've been doing it so long that it's like, oh, this is just what you do. What are you doing? No idea. The same thing I always do. How do you do that? No idea, right? What are you talking about?
So it's actually really good for me because in order to broadcast to you guys what it is that I'm doing and how you can use it to the best of your advantage, I have to actually think about what I'm doing too. But it really doesn't take a lot of brain power to commit all this to just being part of your muscle memory and your projects. Honest to God, it ain't that tough. But like anything, it does require that you put a little bit of braining, braining power towards it for a brief time so that you can get it down enough to know how to repeat it, where to do it, all that kind of stuff. All that good stuff. Soft red gummy candy, I think they're supposed to taste like linen, linen, lingen, lingonberry, I think is what you're trying to say. Lingonberry, isn't it? L-I-N-G, lingonberry? Swedish fish. Swedish fish are like gummy fish, right? Isn't that a thing? I, feel, I know I've had Swedish fish before. Go ahead and taper that shine all the way down the nose, but do it with a lot less paint now. Give us a really good contrast side to side on the face. Really digging it. He's looking very nice. Uh. Oh, wow. So much left to do. Okay, then. Need more paint. Just turn on the part of your brain that's meant to be smart, and you'll be painting models in your sleep in no time. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there you go. Just imagine you guys naked. Why in the world would one do that? I mean, Doka, I love you and all, but really? <laughs> what, what are we trying to... Uh, what's the goal here? Like, <laughs> what, is, what is gained from this line of thinking that you're enforcing upon us right now? Picture chat naked, like all together in a big room, kind of naked, like weird, like, you know, nerd hobby orgy naked. What am, what am I, what are we really talking about here? Since I'm, I'm further away, our light source is hitting over here. So we have these shines that are over here that are kind of first, you know, order shines, if you want to call it that. Then these second order reflections that are kind of over the circumference of the cylinder here. I'm only doing small dots. Still bringing some brightness onto them, but not down the whole length like we did over here. Right? And less of the edge, if any, gets hit. Probably want to do a little bit right here. If I can squeeze some extra color out of this brush and tee that one off just a little bit, but not much. Because that gives it the feeling that it's away from our light source. We need to grab this one, though. Ah. Maybe a little right here. Now 
aren't. That flattens out into nothing anyway. Probably from mold line scraping. That one, go, that one goes away. I'm like, oh, it doesn't exist anymore. Very odd. Kind of does the same thing over there, though, I guess. And then probably just the same little bit running across the top here. Trying to play Hades over on your other screen. Please stop making me want to go there. <laughs> go where? Wait a minute. You got to read chat. This isn't my fault. <laughs> Panthera, this isn't my fault. How is that Hades game? Do you dig it? It looks pretty cool as like a roguelike. I, I look at more video games and think about playing more video games than I will ever play. I keep up with that world just because I was part of it for so long, but... I, I just don't really do anything with the, the knowledge that I gain anymore. I'll sit and look on Steam and then, you know, add things to my wish list and then never, ever go back and look at my wish list. I used to, back when we played games on stream all the time, there used to be people that would send me Steam gifts all the time. And so I have all these games anyway that I've just never played and never will, most likely. But I keep looking at it. I got the same disease everybody else does. Drag a little bit of light down the edge towards our light source from those secondary reflections, but nothing else over on the other edge. Maybe a little bit right here, although this, this pouch would most likely kill the reflectivity of this with its shadow, but we're going to sneak it in there because I like it, and I'm doing what I want. Probably get a little bit. Super thin line up at the top of that panel right there. That works. We got all that. We're working on the head. doohickey up top. Again, just tap a little bit of color, find that separation, give the shape of the model back. Then we're going to do, we're going to start in on some of these uh, elliptical highlights on the head and such. So our paint is semi-thin, not super thin. But again, we're just going to take the tip of the brush, right, and start. We already have the shape, right? We have this elliptical shape right on top of the head. And so it's brightest right here. So I'll start there, and I'll just kind of start tapping in some of the white. Tail it off back this way, thicken it up up in here. And then before I get too much paint on there, start banging my finger smudger on there to knock it back down a bit. And I can come in and nestle a little bit more white in towards our brightest area and we just keep repeating but putting less and less paint in there so it doesn't tail off as much smack it with my smudger you have a built-in paint smudger called your finger <laughs> Durgum, what's going on it's a built-in paint smudger it's your finger all right i'm going to get a little bit of this thing causing a reflection in the forehead right here. I'm going to tap a little bit of white paint around in that. Bang. I 
like that. Come back after it. Like so. I can uh, bring a little bit more down into the forehead area, real light brush strokes, and then tapping that will give it even, make it even dimmer. And that gives me a good metallic glow on the head with a little reflection dot of the rangefinder thing or whatever that is back onto the helmet. We got to do the same thing on all of this stuff over here. So again, our bright spot on this. These, these are weird spherical objects, but they flatten out like they would go into a cylinder going this way. So I typically bring this highlight from over here on the edge out into the center here and then kind of make it a little bit bigger, stipple it out a little bit bigger there, then smudge that. Then come back in and keep focusing in on the circle, but not the other area that led into it. Just keep playing around until I like the shine on it. I'm not going for super shiny. Let me go back to just standard finding our edges here. Get that shine along this little section of the backpack. Man, it's freaking hot in here. I wonder if the AC stopped. Uh, right as I say that, it turns on. Thank you, AC, for listening. He's like, wait, wait, wait. I was just taking a lunch break. I'm back. Don't get, don't talk to the manager. Start picking up those edges that are going to be where our light source is coming from. I'm going to have to turn the model around a lot because these slots will actually have the right opening, right side of the opening be highlighted. And I want to start bringing the highlight towards the top. So I'm just going to try to get the brush in there and start highlighting that edge up this way. Find this edge right here. I already got these. Need to get this one like so. Carry this one down a little bit further there.
You can see how that blue that we sprayed through there gives it kind of a greenish quality almost, right? I want the shine that goes right down the middle of the top. I'm just going to poke paint, stipple that in there and create a line. Thicker over on this side. Like so. Wipe my damn smudger off. And smudge it. Uh, the bottom of these things I've been doing because they would get some light intrusion right down here. Like that. And then just wipe if you get a little that comes off the lip. Works pretty good. Let's get uh, light, light actually over to this side maybe. A little thin right there. Turn that corner just a hair. Hey, thank you. We like you too. Nexus Live, what is going on? We are currently, for anybody that's just joining us, I got most of it all wrapped up in. Uh, in my hand, but we're doing black armor, so we're working through all the steps. We started this guy on Tuesday's show, and uh, now today on the second show of doing him, we have gotten to the point where we're really digging our kind of neat reddish, bluish blacks that we've thrown on there, and uh, doing all our edge highlighting to bring that shine in, and then uh, it'll be on to details by the end of the show. Got about an hour left today. We've done quite a bit already. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome, welcome. If you have any questions, one of the big things around here is that you're free to ask them at any time. Make sure that you tag me in chat. You'll see the bot tell you to do so from time to time. Also a very helpful group of people in chat. Some really, really good painters and very friendly folks all around. Only a few of them will bite, so. Gotta watch out for that one, that Monument Gentastic one. Be careful of her. Don't trust that one. That Telemachus guy. If you're ready for the worst jokes on the planet, then he's your guy. But hopefully you get used to it. It'll grow on you. It's kind of like fungus, but, you know. It is also a work in progress day. Exclamation point WIP in chat, and you can log into uh, the Monument website. It takes you over to the secret page on the store where you can... show off your work that you've been doing. So it doesn't matter if you are a brand new hobbyist or a person that's been doing it for years and years and years. We are here to offer whatever we can in terms of assistance. Might just be saying, oh my God, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen. But if you've got anything in particular that you're looking to accomplish that you might be having problems with, some new technique you're trying, something you wanna try but you're not sure where to start, Feel free to post up over there. There's a section when you post your picture that says uh, description. Just put in the description any questions you may have, things you might be stuck on, whatever. We do it all around here, so don't, don't be afraid. Our main goal is to get people confident in their hobby. We also sell some of the best hobby products that we make by hand. So 
So if you enjoy what you see here on this stream, exclamation point store will take you over again to the Monument Hobby store. You can see all the paints I'm using, all the brushes I'm using. We're using a number two Monument Igniter, one of our Kalinsky Sable brushes. So for all this detail work that I've been doing on all these models, we've been painting the... Uh, uh, this is our third Marine in a series where we're going through and showing you the techniques that I use with Pro Acryl to do various, uh, what we'll call air quotes, standard paint jobs for Marines. So we've so far completed a Ultramarine, right? So we've got him where we work through with all of our blues and uh, really happy with how that turned out. Then we did a Dark Angel doing the same process, but using a bunch of greens. Uh, virtually the same method for both of the, the green and the blue, more of a, a study in what colors we would use. Uh, and now we've gone in and we're doing black. And the black we've done in a different method to the others because in order to get black to work right, you really do need to attack it a little bit differently than other colors. I'm not saying you have to. You can paint black very similar to other ones, but you're always fighting with making it not look too gray. right? And so here what I'm doing is showing you how to uh, do a black and have it be something that has a bunch of really, really cool depth and color to it. Uh, you know, while at the same time not moving away from feeling black, right? We don't have gray armor, we have black armor, but we do have enough color intruding on it that it doesn't get to be so flat that, you know, you feel like, oh, that's really dull, right? After this, we'll be doing, what do we say we were doing next? Blood Angels or Imperial Fists? I, I feel like we're doing red next, right? And there's a lot of people asking for white scars, so I'm probably going to have to come up with a sixth Marine and a seventh Marine. This could go on for years, by the way. Uh, but we'll probably be doing white as well because uh, I've had a lot after people have seen this and understood what we're doing. Now I'm starting to get a tidal wave of other people who haven't ever contacted me before saying what I really want is. And so I'm really happy to do that. Um, and I think white is a good one because white is another color that's very prevalent, but very hard to paint. It seems like it would be really simple because you just have a bottle of white paint. You null oil it and shade it and you have white marine, but it's not that easy. So we'll do white for white scars too. So I think next we'll do Blood Angels, then Imperial Fists, then White Scars. Then we're probably done with Marines for a minute. That'll take us probably through the end of August <laughs> right there. So we'll see. Mo, what is years for? Yeah, and the blues we did work for librarians. So, you know, a lot of what we're doing is just compiling things. Like this black would work great for all your chaplains, right? So if it doesn't matter what chapter you're doing, we're doing to do him up as Raven Guard just because, whatever. Um, but no matter what you're painting in black, this method works. So we're not doing it chapter specific. We're just showing you vibrant blue, vibrant green, black. You know, we'll do a, a good vibrant red, a good yellow, uh, and then we'll do white. Uh, and then if there's something else, I forget, there's something else that somebody asked me about that would be cool. Purple. Um, so we've been asked to do like an Emperor's Children style deal for purples. So we probably will do a purple one down the road. We may not throw that in right now um, because I may be sick of painting Marines after we do two or three more of these, but we'll see. Dude, it's been, it's been two, under two weeks and we've done two models that we've finished. Come on, man. Come on, man. Mo is like years. Doka says you're going to paint your new custom chapter next, right? No, I didn't. Those words never uttered from my mouth. What color am I going to do his shoulder pad? I think people wanted me to do red on the right one and black on the left, but I'm going to do it black metallic. So if you look at our Dark Angel, right, uh, the green trim on the shoulder pads, I did in a different kind of green metallic from the green of the armor. So I'll do the same general idea for the trim on this shoulder pad over here, black metallic, but a different black metallic than the armor. I won't do any color in it. It'll just be blacks and grays. So like dark, dark steel. Think of it that way. And I'll do the same thing for the Imperialis on his chest. Um, I'll, I'll do it as just non-colored steel because I'm, I'm doing all of the steel for the, the chain blade teeth and the guns. We're using blue black for those, right? So we've got that kind of bluish gray steel that we're doing on all of the the chain and, and all of that so we'll do we're continuing to do that on all of them um but i'll do just silver non-metallic on the imperialis and uh and very very dark silver you know black shiny is what it becomes on the shoulder plate and then red metallic on this one so it won't be it won't be the same painted red that i'm doing for the uh the gun casing and the sword casing i'll i'll, I'll try to do it different like maybe with some purples in it so it gives it like a deep red metallic look. We'll figure it out. 
third company? Is that what it is? I have no idea. But the red was a neat kind of, you know, punch. Although somebody said purple too, and we painted his eyes purple. So somebody had said that we'd do like the trim in purple, that there was a company that had that. But now that we've done the eyes in purple, I think the red probably makes more sense. What do you need to do to get me to paint Howling Griffins or some other quartered marine? Oh, geez. I love quartering, um, so it wouldn't take a whole lot. The problem is that, like, we'd have to pick two colors that we haven't already done as, as part of this deal. Because I'm only painting these not to show you. I mean, quartering's easy. You just paint this quarter, this quarter, this quarter, this quarter. So there's nothing really technique-wise to show you there, except if you wanted to mask it with the airbrush. That can get a little tricky. Um, but generally, I would paint those by hand. Uh, but we'll already be doing red and, and, and yellow marines, so there's not really a whole lot there to show off. Um, but if we pick two colors, you know, that, you know, maybe that would be a good way to do the purple and throw it in quartered with something else that we haven't done. I want to do an all over white marine like we're doing an all over black, just because I feel like that's going to help people with everything. Like mentioned apothecaries, if you're doing white armored tau, uh, just being able to pull off a fully white model is a trick in and of itself. So we'll do a fully white model. I was going to say purple and white quartering would be really bitching from a look standpoint, but we can do purple and then something else, you know, quartered with something else, purple and bone, maybe, you know, like purple and, and bone color could be really neat. So maybe that's what we'll do. We'll quarter, instead of painting an, you know, an, an uh, uh, Emperor's Children model, because it's not going to be a Chaos Marine, I don't think. Although Mediocre has some Chaos Marines he was going to uh, donate. Um, but it would be a lot easier to do a regular Marine. The Chaos Marines just have too many bits on them. So just for painting expediency, it's tougher for me to get through them quickly. But maybe we'd take another regular Marine and quarter them in bone and purple. That'd show you how to paint the purple, because that's not going to be different for like the whole model, and it's pretty easy. And then bone, and that way it could show you quartering. I could do something like that, maybe. Purple and neon green. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> uh, no. Actually, you know who's got some good purple and green marines is uh, Rainer. He's been doing his, I think they're called liquefactors, the custom chapter he's doing, and he's been doing a lot of purples and greens and stuff, and some of those are really cool. Doka's like, purple and green! just never opened your boxes yet exactly yeah i know karate you were talking about uh raven guard so i'm glad that you got to catch the black armor hopefully this fits with what you're doing or wanting to do uh like i said you know we've got the kind of bluish red you know if you've got the the black red in the shadows kind of a wine color in the shadows that pokes through just barely and then of course the kind of grayish blue that comes through from the blue filter on the black up top where the light's reflecting um you know so you, you can do that but you don't have to Right. You could do all of this with none of that in there. I'm just a big fan of a little bit of color in my black armor uh, because it gives it so much extra depth. But a lot of people will ask, hey, can I just do black that way? And yes, you don't have to mix the red and the blue in. That doesn't, you know, all that does is add a little bit of, of pop to it. Uh, it doesn't become a necessity. You can do everything that I'm showing you here uh, without ever adding in those colors. If you wanted to just paint black the GW style way, right? The GW way has got like maybe a little bit of blue on your edge highlights or something like that would fix the, the monotonous black issue. Find a little bit of shine on this side too. We've got all these body parts and things that are going to be reflecting back into their own neighbor panels of armor and such. So, we can cheat a little bit and put some brightness here. Again, just using a lot thinner color for this so that none of my lines get really blocky and aren't as bright as over here. Oh, we still got to do this shoulder plate, don't we? Oops. Oops. 
trying to get away from doing the shoulder plate. All right, so this I need to be really thin with. So again, I just get my, you can see how thin we're going to be going. And I'm just going to pull a kind of a starburst here, right? I'm going to pull from down low up to the top of the shoulder from all directions back to the center. And it'll make this kind of starburst shape, if you will, and drop all the color right here at the top and then stitch that together. Now that's really thin, so I gotta leave that alone. I gotta go over here and do it over on this other shoulder too. Don't try to pile your paint one layer on top of the other too fast when you're painting this thin. Uh, it will not like it. It will start to move and could actually peel the layers underneath it up and cause you all sorts of angst. That's way too thin, I think. There we go. Again, so my brush truck is going to uh, come from back here where the shadow of the backpack is up towards that middle spot and then take just very, very thin brush strokes around the clock, right? So start over here at whatever the clock that is and all the way around the circumference, drag and paint up to this spot here and then stipple that spot together so that where all your lines meet is smoothed out. real sure what's going on right there. Did that tear? What is that? What the hell is going on right there? I feel like something might have just torn right there. That bright white makes no sense at all. What the absolute heck is going on there? There's nothing. I have no idea what's going on there. I feel like that's tearing. But why am I seeing white? What in the world is happening here? I'm going to start messing with that because I have no idea what's going on there. I feel like the paint is tearing. But I have no idea why. Because that's not happening over here, is it? Yeah, it's nothing on the brush. That's the weirdest thing I've ever seen. Huh. Huh. All right, now we have to do some science. I'm going to assume that maybe I got a greasy finger on there before we actually painted the... Uh, the transparent on. I'm just going to make sure I'm... not going to see any more paint tear off of that. It's really weird because I'm not getting any color off on there. There wasn't like an egg. There, I have no white on the palette, so it's not white paint. Very strange. It's a white hole. Yeah, I don't know what the hell that is, man. Could be T. Schmidt. Could be that I just, it's probably not dust. It's probably that I got, I probably, when I was holding the model before I went to using this, right? Uh, we live in the desert, so it's very, very hot. My hands have been clammy all day. So every now and then I'm going to get a little bit of, uh, uh, sweat and hand oil on it. So I may have when I touch the model. Maybe I ate lunch before we started the stream. So I don't know. I don't know. It had happened anywhere else. So knock wood. We're just going to go through and uh, and fix it real quick. I shouldn't have played with it so much. I started uh, 
Like, what is this? Why does it hurt when I do this? Stop doing that. So I'll get some black transparent and a little bit of blue transparent, and we will make this color that we sprayed through the airbrush over here, because I think, yeah, we cleaned the airbrush way a long time ago. I'm just going to make this same color match that. That's pretty good. <sighs> and I'm going to have to be very careful here. Shh, we're hunting wabbits. And I'm just going to slowly add color in there. Hmm. I may not be able to do the blotting part. I may just have to throw that on there and let it stay as a dark spot and then we'll paint over it lighter and then come back with this color again. Let's see. We'll play with it and see. I'm gonna let that dry. So it is gonna be just a dark tear right now and then we'll fix the tear. The good thing is it's right up where our highlight is gonna be so we'll just keep white or, or lightening that up so it's uh, it's good. It didn't tear like in the middle of a blend or something. So we okay. We're okay. It's unfortunate that it's not where um, we have a logo or anything going, though. That's a problem. Now that this side's dry, we'll come back over here, continue doing what we were trying to do over there. That's what we should have got. You saw me use the Q-tip to, uh, to blot that one. Um, be careful. Don't use the Q-tip everywhere. You, you can get frantic with it, and the Q-tip can rip your paint. The paint will grab onto the hairs of the Q-tip, and you can yank more layers apart than I've found you do with your finger. So just a real light touch with your finger tends to smudge things a lot better than the Q-tip. Okay, so that's dry now. I wonder, I, I'm very thin right now, so I don't know that this is going to, that's not going to do anything. That's not going to do anything. I was too thin to cover up a darker color. But we can take this and play around with it now and see what we can get. I'm still too wet. I think I just need to stop messing around and let's just go bright right here. Again, just kind of stippling that edge because I got to cover up that darkness that we created. And 
we'll just keep working with that. I'll let that dry every time I go through and add a little bit of color to it. We'll let it dry and then we'll come back. I have a very bad habit that doesn't really rear its head until the end of a model where I will put my finger right on the model to stabilize when I'm doing something like these really fine edges. So it could be that I just stuck my finger on the model and got finger oil there and so none of the paint after that was sticking because it didn't take it all the way down to the primer which means that the model and the paint before our uh, last step with the transparency was all fine. So we get the top of that backpack shine nice and neat. And work on the shoulder a little bit more. Hopefully now I can start thinning it down a little bit. I don't want to build it back up to like pure white if I can avoid it. Right now I'm just glazing back to kind of blur that bright area a little bit. Just real thin brush strokes down into my mid-tones, leaving off right at the edge of that bright area to recreate that shine. It's actually not bad. If we brighten up this one to that point, which we need to anyway, we might actually get away with this. Like this may actually be perfect by the time we're done. If we can get this blended highlight to hold out on the edges, this might work perfectly. If I'll stop fooling around and actually get the paint the thickness I need. It's starting to look pretty good. I think we got that one to where now we can work with it and get it fixed pretty easy without having to even worry about the, uh, the transparent paints over the top of it. It just means we're going to have to brighten up these others, which we already knew we were doing anyway. Deadbeat, yeah. Well, the good thing is, I mean, the idea there was we were changing the color of that area when it tore, so we got lucky, right? If we'd have been, like, glazing a shadow on and it had torn in the middle of, like, a blended area that was supposed to be multiple colors, we might have gotten a little angry. It's still just a shoulder pad, so our worst-case scenario is we just, you know, mask off the shoulder pad and redo it from scratch. But I'd like to avoid doing that, right? I think it's okay. I'm not going to be blunting it with my finger too much uh, right now. 
and it has a little texture that I got to fix, right? But overall, it's pretty good. Now I just need to match that kind of brightness in the uppermost shine on this shoulder pad and see if we like that balance of value on the model. Which doesn't seem too bad right now. It's a little bit of a bigger glow than I wanted, but I think I'm liking the way it's looking, right? As, it's, as I balance this side out, I think we're okay. I got to do a little bit more on the head, too, then. So again, just taking these very, very quick brush strokes all the way around the circumference of where the shine wants to be, back to the middle, and let it sit for just a split second, then hit it. Bam. And pretty quick, we balance that all out. I think that's going to look fine. What do you guys think? I like the shine. I probably got to boost the shine on the backpack now, too. But I don't think it throws the model off. Right? Obviously, we want the brightest shine up on the top. I think it works fine. Yeah. Yeah, it's just a tad bigger than I really wanted it to be, the shine over on that shoulder, but I think we can get that all fixed. Let's do the same thing over here. We'll just punch this brightness up a little bit. There you go. You guys asked to see how I get to fix mistakes. There's one. That was a panic moment. I don't really ever panic, though. It's all fixable. I probably get more bent out of shape when I'm not streaming, right? I would say. Because then I'm like, start freaking wrecking, fracking, idiot. <laughs> Because most of my mistakes are done just by doing stupid stuff that I don't recognize in time. The, uh, I tore off a huge chunk of paint on the Dark Angel arm uh, off stream when I was messing around with painting the freehand stuff. So I was fairly glad that you guys weren't there for that. I didn't get angry about it, but I was like, oh, that's kind of inconvenient to have to redo that thing. I'll show you where I had to fix it. You can get a laugh. It starts to be fine. I don't mind that. A little bit of cleanup on those. I just think that I need to maybe fill this in a little. Yeah, the center was just a little, had a little bit of darkness to it. I think that's better. Hmm. 
Not too shabby. I'm not mad at that. Time is 6.30, so just a couple more lines, and we can stop and take a look at some whip. So if you've thrown whip up there, don't worry, we will be getting to it. Much thinner shine lines on this side because it's away from our light source. So we don't want to create big blocky reflections over here. We can still have shine that makes sense and have it look good, but we're just doing thinner lines. And I'm just poking these lines on. Remember, I'm not ever really drawing a line. Here I am. Here I'm kind of just pulling a line down. But for all these, I'm mainly just kind of poking this edge along. I think we're good. I'll come back at the end and, and do some more uh, edging along the backpack vents and stuff when we get all that figured out. Oh, we got a little bit underneath here, don't we? On the inside of his right arm. I forget, we got a little bit of light that falls in there. And we always take a look and we come back and adjust things. We've gone and, and on all these models, we've pretty much taken the armor to done a lot quicker than we normally would, right? I'm always telling you to uh, make sure that you don't work to finish one part of a model before you've done enough on all the parts to see how they work together. Color and vibrancy and value-wise, all of that good stuff. And that's, uh, that's how we typically paint. Space Marines, uh, you can kind of go a little bit outside the, of that rule, uh, only because you've probably painted a ton of Space Marines. You kind of know what's going to look like what, how it's all going to work together. And it's not as big of a, you know... A, experiment as some models are when you haven't done all of those shapes before. A Space Marine's a Space Marine's a Space Marine for the most part. So we don't find ourselves in, in you know, a position where we don't know how another thing is going to look. You know, and we're pretty sure that when I put the white logo on the shoulder pad, it's going to look okay. Right? I'm pretty sure that, you know, when I paint the red casing of the gun, it's not going to mess up any of the value I have on this black armor. But because I haven't gone to pure white on the armor, I always have the ability to pump the armor up a little bit. And we won't do that until we get done with a lot more of the work on the, the gun and such. So. shine on the inside of that arm. You probably need to find a little bit of glow. On some of these bits. Find some of those edges so I give a little bit of texture to that side of his face. I don't want to brighten up those edges too much, but with my paint really thin, I can get away with that. And that's pretty good. So bingo, black armor. In what, one and a half streams? Not too shabby. Not too bad at all. This is our angle that we said from the beginning was going to be our focus point where we'd 
use the, the most of the camera angle. So we have that nice shine that goes angled from his left shoulder to right knee. We've got this good shine that comes from the left side of his body covering all of this stuff. We didn't shine the shoulder pad the same way so that the shoulder pad looks like it's a different material than the armor plating, which I like. And then we'll add even another layer of uh, material or texture, if you want to call it that, to the trim around the shoulder plate too when we do the non-metallic shine on it. It won't have any of the bluish and reddish shine that the armor does. So we've got this nice shiny black armor, but we have all these other uh, materials and textures brought in by not doing the, you know, I took away the cylindrical vertical shine on the shoulder plate that we had that had that bright shine coming down. It's still there in mid-tones. You can still see it in mid-tones on the shoulder plate, but we decided not to shine it up uh, super bright so that we could keep it a little bit different than uh, than all of the, uh, the other armor plates because it's going to have that big white Raven Guard logo on it. So too much shine, I feel like, on the shoulders. I, I always really find myself wanting them to be a little different. I'm gonna pull a little bit more brightness right on the top of the head to match the shoulders. Like so. And give it a chance to sit there for just a sec and then donk. And you forget when you're looking at it by itself how dramatic the look really is until you see it next to other colors. Ta-da, black armor. 